Happiness is a trap, and most people waste their entire lives chasing it. As today's guest says, happiness is a direction, not a destination. And the real destination you should be chasing is far more interesting and potent than mere happiness. So join me today with Arthur Brooks as we explore the joys of an honorable life lived in pursuit of pleasure, power, and success instead. Why is it a trap to think that you can be happy? Because happiness is not a destination. Happiness is a direction. Happiness is the idea that you can be blissful and happy all the time. Is It's not just unrealistic, it's unhealthy. It would be terrible if you were happy all the time. You'd be eaten by a tiger immediately. You would be, uh, you'd be, you'd have no uh, um, negative feelings which keep you alive. I mean, the idea of, you know, the limbic system of your brain that's producing sadness and anger and disgust and, and fear, these are the, the emotions that have kept you alive. I mean, your Pleistocene ancestors would have been eaten by an animal immediately. You'd be run over by a car. You need these things that actually make you at least temporarily unhappy, or you can't put one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. Therefore, happiness is the wrong goal. The right goal is happier. So that's really what we're trying to do. And to get happier is a process all throughout your life. And to be on the path toward what Oprah Winfrey calls happierness you, you actually need a system that makes it possible and so that you can pursue it and you need to pursue it. The reason people need to watch Impact Theory, by the way, is nice. because this is a pursuit of happiness show. This is all about pursuit. This is all about achievement. It's about trying. It's about making your life better. It's about, it's about progress. This is one of the most important points of human flourishing. This is about progress. You know, you've, you, people often ask, why is it so relatively easy to lose weight but impossible to keep it off mm. it's because when the scale goes down each day it gives you this incredible reward but when you hit your goal the reward is never eating anything you like ever again for the rest of your life everything in life is progress and that's why the pursuit matters so that you can actually be on the trail toward happierness and that's the right goal for all of us it's really interesting i like that a lot I think a lot about the traps. So right. when I think about what impact theory is and what I'm trying to make it, it started out pretty simplistic. So we're in phase three of impact theory at this point because it it's really me trying to figure out, okay, how do you get out of the spiritual entertainment and into the real thing that people need to actually do and understand in order to make progress, in order to be happier, in order to be more fulfilled is how I think mm -hmm. about it. Um, but the way that people get trapped is very counterintuitive to me. And you're the only person that I've ever heard bring it up. I don't know if you consider it the, the central thesis, but you've talked about how people get stuck in their perceptions. Yeah. And that to me is very interesting. And there's really, I think, two ways that people get stuck by their perceptions. One is they confuse them with objective reality. Mm. So they just think, oh, the thing I believe is true. Right. And so if you don't believe it, you just don't see the truth. And then the other way that people get trapped by perception is they identify themselves with it. And so they love that they are on the left or the right. right. And so you end up with this vicious cycle of, I'm proud that I have recognized the truth and I feel good about myself for noticing how wrong you are. Yeah. And so we end up in a pretty gnarly situation where they're not actually happy. That's right. the freaky thing. So how do people begin to unwind that? Well, so there's a lot, there's a lot in what, I mean, I agree with everything that you said, but there's so much in mm -hmm. what you said too, that, that, that helps us understand the, the, bad situation or the conundrum that our country is in, that the world is in. And it has everything to do with our inability to, to, to stop seeing ourselves in terms of the things that we think. This is a classic kind of attachment. So Buddhists talk about this a lot. So Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Vietnamese Buddhist monk, who, you know, one of the, one of the most important uh, Buddhist teachers of the last 50 years died just a couple of years ago. And he used to talk about the, the worst kind of attachments that we have in modern life is the attachment to our views, mm. the attachments to what we think. That's just as bad as being attached to your watch or your car or your television to say, you know, like, I love my, I love my car. I mean, what's wrong with you? I love your car. It's a thing. You shouldn't, you, 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 you only use things and you only love people. I mean, that's an iron law of happiness. But the thing is all, that, that we, we do a version of this ideologically where we say that we, we, we're so identified with the things that we think that it becomes an attachment, that it becomes almost a love attachment in our lives. Now that's really alienating. That's incredibly alienating because you are not your views and I am not mine. 
And, and that's incredibly important for us to be able to learn for this pursuit of happiness, for progress in and of itself, is to not be the things that we think and to recognize that we think many things that are wrong. We just don't know which they are. The reason people watch this show and listen to this show is because they want to learn more so they can update their views, which is an acknowledgement that their views weren't perfect to begin with, that their knowledge wasn't perfect to begin with. Now, when you're being taught by a, a, a you know baby boomer culture warriors that are trying to conscript child soldiers into their culture war, they will say, if you don't think these things, something is morally defective about you and you will have the perfect truth. You will have the, the secret Gnostic truths if you do believe these things. And at that point, our beliefs, including political beliefs, have just become a religion. Mm. They've just become, no, a cult. And, and that's really what we see. And so people are inducted into these competing cults all the time. And, you know, look, I, I have a traditional religion and I identify with my religion, but I don't know if I'm right. Even on that, I don't know the things that, I, that, are, that are right. And that's been incredibly freeing for me. And that's ultimately what we all have to acknowledge. I think these things, but I'm willing to be corrected if I get better information, and the only way I'm going to do that is to go to people who disagree with me, people who think differently than me, people who threaten my preconceived notions, and, and to take it in and say, you disagree with me, Tom, come sit next to me. Yeah. I got to hear it. Why is that freeing? Why is it freeing to acknowledge that you almost certainly are wrong mm -hmm. and to invite people to challenge those ideas? For most people, that that's like arresting. Yeah, well, that's a hard thing to do because that actually goes against, that, 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 that contravenes evolution. Evolution is, tells us that we need to believe particular things and to defend them. And the ego threats are actually dangerous to us because if, you know, if, we're, if we show ourselves to be wrong to others, then that makes us look incompetent. Then we're less likely to survive. We're less likely to thrive in a community. We're less likely to rise in a hierarchy. We're less likely to find mates. Mm -hmm. And so the result is that you defend, 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 defend. But we don't have to do that. That's hugely maladapted in modern life, particularly with modern technology. I mean, think of the technology that, that we're using right now to record this show and that people are using to watch us right now. That's an updating learning technology. And if you're stuck in the static, the stasis of, of uh, here's this body of information that I have and it must all be right, you're, you've basically said that you can't grow and learn. So you have to relax that evolutionary imperative. You have to fight back against what mother nature is putting into you. That's in, you know, this is the way that philosophers will always talk about sort of the animal path and the divine path. The animal path is going according to your evolutionary imperatives. These are the things that I, it's like, if it feels good, do it. It's the best way to ruin your life. <laughs> the divine path is to stand up to the things that feel unnatural. You know, we do this all the time. I mean, you and I work out every day. Right. And, and that's a, it's the, the na nature's path is sit on the couch, right? Nature's path is eat that sweet thing, right? And, and the divine path is to do things that are hard, that don't feel natural because you know, you're, you're, you, you've been given a prefrontal cortex where you can make conscious decisions that are better than what, what your feelings tell you that they should be. So Mother Nature says, defend your opinions at all costs, because if you don't, it's an ego threat and it could have, you know, could have catastrophic consequences for your position in the hierarchy. But you know that if you don't defend your positions, if you admit to the possibility that you're not right, that you learn and you update, and when people say things that you think are crazy, you say, tell me more, that you're actually going to get better. And that's a conscious decision. Mm, yeah. So one, the fact that it's a conscious decision, I think is really important for people. It's something you talk about in the book that uh, when people have collision of values, mm. they can really run into a problem. One of the things, and going back to the question I was asking, one of the things that I think really causes problems for people is they have a value system. They've never articulated it to themselves. Right. They've never documented it, written it down. So they know these are my actual values. And then they don't realize that those are choices. Again, they're mistaking them for this is how the world ought to be. Um, and when they collide with other people, they just assume you don't recognize the way the world ought to be. You are bad, you're right. a moron, whatever. And now you get these conflicts. And you said in the book that uh, families break up because you didn't say collision of values, but that's how I read it to mean 
and people expect it to be something else. I forget what you said people expect it to be. Well, but... they think it's because of a behavioral discrepancy. It's usually a values discrepancy mm. is the way that it works out. So the way that families tend to break apart, and, and again, no joke, one in six Americans is not talking to a family member today because of politics, wow. which is craziness for happiness. It's cra There's one reason of a schism with family, and that's abuse. And political differences. The one reason that there should be yeah, that's the only legitimate reason to have a schism Got in your family is because of abuse. And and differences of political opinion are not abuse. Right. At least they weren't. They didn't used to be abuse. But if you're being convinced by you know by, by leaders who are trying to, to bring you into their culture war, trying to make you a soldier in their culture war, they'll say if somebody disagrees with your view on you know Supreme Court decisions or something that they're somehow uh, erasing your value as a human being. I mean that's this wild leaps of logic, and and we hear about this on college campuses where I spend a lot of my time. Obviously, that we're telling people that if people disagree with you, that they're erasing you, mm. that they 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 disagree with your existence or something. It's just this crazy existential language that that we're using that's way out of proportion to everything. So. The only reason to have these schisms is 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 actual abuse, and, and again, people disagree with what abuse is, but it's not that. Okay. Right. Now, what do we find with when when people tend to really have a bad problem in their family? People think that you know, for example, you know, I, I deal with a lot of students, and they're they're building their lives and figuring out how they're going to live their own lives, and it turns out that they disagree with their parents on a lot. They come home from college saying different things, for example. They, you know, they're living in a particular different way, things that their parents might really disagree with. It turns out that how you live your life doesn't matter. It almost never matters and almost never leads to schism. What you say about somebody else's values is what really matters. So if you want to have a really big, so all the, you know, all the people in college who are watching us, and you have, I know you have a huge audience in their, in their late teens and 20s or Impact Theory fans, which is great. If you want to have a, live your life but have a relationship with your parents live your life but don't tell tell your parents that their values are stupid mm. that turns out to be a direct on attack and that leads to bigger problems one thing that's become really popular though is um tell your dad or your uncle who says the racist thing at thanksgiving what you think should they not do that no it's perfectly fine to do that but don't freak out don't freak out you say i you know i see it different yeah hey uncle mark you know, I see it differently. And, 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 and as you do, say to yourself before you begin, I love Uncle Mark. And I'm going to use my values right now as a gift and not as a weapon. Anytime you use your values as a weapon, you've denigrated the moral content. You've eviscerated the effectiveness of your approach. But if you use your values as a gift, it might not always be taken in a charitable way. But you're using them for the right reason. And you've got the odds on chance of actually having a good impact. Hey, this is really interesting. Um, I had Sam Harris on the show, who I have a great deal of respect for. He's become very unpopular in certain circles for the way that he is approaching the problem of free speech. Right. I want to be abundantly clear yeah. that my value system tells me that free speech is worth dying for. And so it isn't the thing that I would expect anybody to reach for and say, okay, we're going to clamp down on that. Right. Now, Sam sees it differently. And as I try to tease out, when a smart person, when I, I learned one immutable truth, when two smart people who are sincere think each other are stupid, right. then odds are that they have different base assumptions. Yeah. And when I correct. look at Sam and I say, okay, Sam's base assumption is that if something is an existential threat, then it's worth stripping away any right to make sure that we don't succumb to said existential threat. And then I was like, okay because i don't know that i would disagree with that if i knew there was an asteroid hurtling towards earth and it was life or death and we were all going to have to get on the same page and do xyz thing if i really knew that it was do x survive do y everyone dies then i would for sure say do x right it makes sense but i don't think people know how to agree on what is the right course of action. Nor on, do you have perfect when, knowledge. Right, so no perfect knowledge. You don't know if it's actually an existential threat. Right. And so I'll, I'll take it out of that realm for a second. That's the problem, right? People don't right. have perfect knowledge. They don't know, but, and now I'll take it in the realm that I do understand very well. When you're building a business, you must give your team certainty. Right. It's what I call intoxicating them with certainty. It's right. the only way to get them to follow you. Right. Now the catch is, as a leader, you have to balance 
you know that your team has a need for certainty. It's the only way to get them moving in the same direction. Right. But you have to balance that with what we were talking about before, what I call the physics of progress. Mm -hmm. That the only way to make progress is to constantly hunger for how am I wrong? So right. you have to, okay, I was wrong here. I need to update my thinking. I need to update my approach. If you don't do that, you're screwed. But now there's tension between right. I need to present to my team, hey, this is the way, but I also need to beg my team to tell me at all times how I'm wrong, right? Because they're the ones that are, that are going to recognize the flaw in your thinking that are going to show you a better way. Right. So it's this absolutely fascinating mm -hmm. tension. Now, when this plays out in the bigger world with the speed of information that we have today, thanks to the internet and social media, you get this. Right. which I would say has a level of pathology in it that scares the life out of me. Right. So how do we manage that tension of it's imperfect knowledge, but I must give certainty in order to get a country or a globe moving in the right direction. And an easy way to give people certainty is to say, we're all going to die. Right. Right. Which is the thing that people reach for. Right. But if you don't give people certainty, meh, everybody runs in weird directions. Well, the the answer, well, to, to, to the, the Buddhist would say the answer to that question is intention without attachment. Okay. So certainty is this is the direction that we're going. This is the goal. This is the target, as far as I can see it. But I'm not attached to that because this is this is subject to updating. So you'll find, for example, you look at the, the ancient navigational course of Columbus or, you know, the explorers, you know, that had very imperfect tools. They had a concept of the direction that they were going and they had a particular goal and they were going toward that goal with complete certainty. It was, you know, Columbus was an entrepreneur and he was he was taking his team, the Nina Pinton Santa Maria toward this particular goal. And it turned out to be completely wrong. Mm. But the point is that the certainty was the intention, the fact that they got something else that was arguably better, was the lack of attachment to the object of the intention. And this is what we're trying to do in our companies, in our families, and, and indeed in the enterprise, the ultimate enterprise that we need to impact, which is our lives. I mean, it's like you're, you're Tom Inc. That's the real enterprise of you. I mean, it just manifested itself in all sort of these other cool businesses and the things that are really successful, but all those were just expressions of the, of the real enterprise. And each of us is an entrepreneur in the startup of our lives. That's what really matters. And what we need is to always have a clear intention, but not attachment mm -hmm. to the object of that intention, because that makes you dogmatic. And the problem that we have right now is we have fuzzy intention and strong attachment. We have exactly the opposite of what we need in our politics today and the way that people talk to each other, the way that people debate. And so if I have a strong intention of the things that I believe, even politically, but a lack of strong attachment, I can have a conversation. And Sam Harris and I had a similar conversation, except it was about religion. And, you know, I'm, I'm a traditionally religious person and he's an atheist. And, and the way that we went at it, we, before we, we, you know, hit record on a show, we said, we're going to talk about this to learn. We're not going to talk about this to argue. We're going to talk about this to learn, right? And so when he would say something I thought was like, whoa, I'd be like, <laughs> dude, tell me more. Right. And he would say, explain this to me because this sounds crazy to me. So truly explain this to me. So what is that? That was, we both had this intention, but we didn't have the attachment. And so we were willing to update. And in so doing, we got better. Now, when you're running a team, if you've got a company, and I've been a CEO, so I've, had, I've, I've made all these mistakes over the years. If they see that you have this very clear intention, we're running this direction, this is what we think, this is my best judgment, but my attachment to these things is not, is not absolute. You can throw me off this if you actually bring the best possible information to me and you can tell me that, that the way I'm thinking about it is not quite right, then I'm gonna change the intention. But in the meantime, this is the direction that we're all going. That turns out to be the way to square the circle. This turns out to be the way to, to solve this problem personally, in families, in communities, and in companies is intention with that attachment. All right, that's amazing. But how do you do that? How do you, I, I have a feeling that a big part of the problem is people have um, accidentally constructed their identity around that which they think they are. So I am, in fact, oh God, if I can remember, this is maybe a paraphrase, but it's really damn close to something you said. We need less activists and more volunteers. And when You're somebody- uh, You read my column. <laughs> I, I have tried to immerse myself in your world, one for the this, and two, you are incredibly helpful for navigating people trying to do extraordinary things in their life in a way that makes their life better and not yeah. worse. So the, the strivers, 
curse. I forget the exact words you use. It's driver's curse. But oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah you're, uh, you're good. So it, if people identify as an activist yeah. or a volunteer, that that simple, like yeah. even you just giving me the language, I was yeah. like, oh, whoa, yeah. I get what you're trying to say. Yeah. Helping others versus like my identity is this thing right. and, and I'm gonna fight to the death for this. Right. Um, but how do you begin to extricate your identity from the things that you believe so that you can have non-attachment? To begin with, we have to ask, who am I? And, Meaning and you're going to define that or you're going to discover we, we that? Need, we, well, you ultimately discover that, but you have to have an understanding of that that's, that's not brittle and that's not based on the outside world. So just, there's a philosophical concept that William James talked about, but the Eastern philosophers talk about this a lot too, which is what William James called the I-self versus the me-self. The I-self is, is, say you're looking in a mirror, and when you look in the mirror, there's actually, there's two of you. There's the one who's looking and the one who's being looked at. Mm -hmm. The one who's looking is the I self, the observer of the world. The one who's being looked at is the me self, which is the observed. You're going through life as I self and me self. You need me self to know who you are and how you, where you stand in society and where, you know, where you are on the team and where you are in the hierarchy and you know, where you are in traffic for that matter. But you need the I self so that you can learn and you can exist. We are all too heavy on the me self, on the observed, and none of us, almost none of us, is heavy enough on the observer part. So one of the th exercises I'll give my students at you know, Harvard Business School, they take this happiness class, which is about the, you know, it's called leadership and happiness, the serious science of, of the business of you. And, and I'll say, we're gonna go through an hour. You're gonna take an hour where you're not gonna be observed. You're simply going to observe. And now this means a lot. This means, for example, you say like, you don't say, yeah, this coffee's bitter. You say, hmm, this coffee has a bitter flavor. Nothing more than observation. There's no mirrors. There's no not notifications on social media. There's no judgments. There's just observation of the world to get better at that. And this is incredibly important. If we wanna learn and we wanna update, this also gets us away from this whole concept of my identity in my ideology. Because what that fundamentally is, is just me, 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 me. It's like, who am I? I am the things that I think. If somebody disagrees with me, then they are attacking me. That's insanity. That's pure vanity. That is just looking in a mirror all day long saying, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the most beautiful of them all? It's me and my political beliefs. That's craziness. There's no, there's no way to live. And by the way, that's the fastest way to become a truly unhappy person. Why? The reason is because you need the grandeur of the world to actually give you what you need, the experience of day-to-day -day life. And living in the, 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 the image of yourself is just boring. It's just tedious. It, you know, thinking about me and what they think of me and whether or not they agree with me and whether or not these things are gonna satisfy me, 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 me. It's like watching the same episode of the same season of Better Call Saul every single day for the rest of your life. It was okay the first time. It was not that great the second time. And it's awful every time after that. And being forced to do that, that's identity politics. That's the world of identity. That's the world of mirrors. That's the world of social media um, notifications. That's the world of the me self is what it comes down to. So if we really want to be happy, get into the I self, the learning space, the observation, the awe of the outside world, and it, your life will change. It'll just change and it's fast. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the mindset and business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. So in the book, you say that uh, basically exactly what you just said, that happiness isn't the feeling, but the feeling is evidence mm -hmm. of the happiness. Right. So then what is the happiness? What is the meat and potatoes? Yeah, of the meat, it's a, that's a good analogy because it's the, either the courses or really the macronutrients in the, the thing that is happiness is, has three parts to it. And we know this from, from you know, measuring people who have high levels of well-being versus those who don't. High well-being is associated with high levels of enjoyment, satisfaction, and meaning. 
in life. Those are the three things that we need to actually pursue. The pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of enjoyment, the pursuit of satisfaction, and the pursuit of meaning. And there are three different goals with three different sciences and three different strategies to it. When somebody only pursues one, they're not going to be happy. You need a balance and abundance across this macronutrient profile for happiness if you're going to get it. I meet people all the time who have great enjoyment in life but very little meaning and they're not happy. I know people, hardworking entrepreneurs who have tremendous meaning and no quality of life, no enjoyment, they're not happy. And so I have to coach people in different ways about this. Satisfaction is the hardest of them because oh, gonna ask. you can't keep it. You know, and so they each have Why a science. Why can't you keep satisfaction? Because the brain is something, has a tendency to be homeostatic. Homeostasis mm -hmm. is the tendency of the brain to always take you emotionally back to equilibrium. So you'll be ready for the next set of circumstances. Interesting. Can I push back on that? Yeah. So one, obviously I agree with homeostasis, but uh, the way that I've always thought about how transient satisfaction is, going back to understanding the science, mm -hmm. is from an evolutionary standpoint, if you ate a meal and it was satisfying forever, mm -hmm. you would starve to death right. because you would only eat once. Right. And so knowing that evolution will conserve, 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 if I have this mechanism that makes sure that I go do the thing again, that is basically this um, rise and fall of satisfaction that happens with everything that I would be in trouble if I only did once. Right. So uh, thirst. Yeah. Satisfaction, right. going to rise and fall. Hunger, right. rise and fall. Sex, rise and fall, right? right? Um, consumption, consumption, achievement, pursuit, achievement, hierarchy, yeah, yeah, yeah. prestige, the watch, the car, the house, all of well, it. Well, now it's interesting. Now I wonder so if we're that exactly is the same homeostasis. Thing. That is homeostasis. Because the, the watch losing its thing, although it's probably the same mechanism, it's because the, it's trying to get me to go do more, go right. do more. Never and but here's the thing about it, that the reason that we don't, we don't, ever realize that you and you think you know, people say should i move to california because then i'll be permanently happy because of the sunshine no the big benefit that you get from mood benefit from sunshine is six months but the taxes are forever yeah. <laughs> so i have to tell, tell you me about it <laughs> so i'm not trying to hurt you man so um the key thing to understand about homeostasis is that mother nature doesn't want you to know it exists mm. mother nature has homeostasis so that you'll be ready for the next set of circumstances but fools you again and again and again into thinking that this time the satisfaction will be permanent and it never is by the way this is physical too so you step off the treadmill and and your, your heart is going 135 beats per minute, which you're doing for good cardiovascular health. Within 15 minutes, your heart rate has gone back to its base rate so you don't die. Mm. Well, the same thing is true with your emotions. Homeostasis has to reset you. But when it comes to the satisfactions that we seek, you know, caloric or, you know, propagation of the genes through mating and all the stuff that we want to do, we always think that that relationship will give me permanent satisfaction because if you knew... If you knew, then you'd be like, that's going to give me 10 minutes of happiness. I'm not even going to do it. And you'd stop being, you'd, you'd stay, you'd, you wouldn't be in the hustle. You wouldn't be in the fight anymore. You wouldn't go get the banana off the top of the tree and risk your life. You wouldn't trudge across the savanna to get that meal. You would lose your motivation. And Mother Nature wants you to be motivated. And she does that by fooling you so that you think that this time I'm really going to love that car forever. And it's like a month. <laughs> it turns out so that's so satisfaction is a real conundrum only when you understand the science can you short circuit the science only when you when you understand the matrix can you find a glitch in, can you find the glitch in the matrix that's why it's so incredibly empowering because there is a way around that for satisfaction the same thing is true for enjoyment by the way everybody thinks they enjoy it it's just, you know, pleasure wrong Pleasure is not the secret of happiness. Pleasure is the, is the, is the, is the short way to get addiction. Hmm. And nobody ever says, you know, yeah, man, you know the secret of my happiness? Methamphetamine. Never. Nobody ever says, oh, yeah, it's like partying away my entire paycheck in Vegas hmm. and then my wife leaving me. That's, that's not the secret of happiness. That's the secret to pleasure. And pleasure is not connected to happiness unless you take pleasure and you add two things, people and memory. If you add pleasure plus people plus memory, you get enjoyment. Uh, those must be stand-ins for something. What are the the people and the memories? Communion for? and consciousness. So, so just uh, I you am, have to do it I'm together. I'm a social species, and yeah. I'm going to get tremendously rewarded. This uh, this is a good time to bring up. So. I'm really obsessed with this idea that running in the back of your mind are evolutionary algorithms right. and there's no escaping them. And mm -hmm. so there are just certain things you are going to have to do if you want to 
I don't know if you're going to agree with this framing, but if you if you're going to feel the way you want to feel, mm -hmm. you must be aware of these algorithms. You must acknowledge them. Right. So I've always tried to migrate people away from happiness, not as you define yeah. it, as the smell of the turkey. Right. Stop worrying about Stop the worrying emotion. about happy feelings. Right. Exactly. Right. Because they're so transient. Correct. And get to fulfillment. Correct. And fulfillment for me has a formula. I'll be interested to see if you agree with this. Um, these are based on what I consider the evolutionary algorithms running in your mind that there is no escape from. So you are going to have to work hard. Anything that comes easily will just not, it won't resonate. That's a satisfaction issue, by the way. Satisfaction is the joy that comes after struggle. That's what satisfaction is. So you get satisfaction. Does it always have to come from struggle. It ha you have to do something, and you, it's a, the sense of earning oh, something. Well. So, for example, if Can you I, if you, che you cheat on the exam, yes. and you get an A. There's no satisfaction. True, but I feel deeply satisfied after good sex. Do I feel like I earned it? I don't know. I have not investigated this feeling. Yeah, but that's do that's actually think? that's that's not satisfaction. That's enjoyment. Is it? That's what you, in satisfaction. You don't feel sexually satisfied? Well, that's a word that we use, but it's different than what we're talking about here. So it's, it, it, and again, the, we're, we're defining the terms of the Which problem. Which I think is important. Super important. Because right? you may be about to have me separate two ideas yeah. that because I don't have words for, I yeah, don't Yeah, people talk about sexual satisfaction, where they're talking yes. about a sexual enjoyment. So mm -hmm. an enjoyment is there a is better some, word when you're for it. Done, so when I am mm -hmm. overcome with desire, right. the right way to think of it for me is hunger. It feels the same. Right. I've got to have this thing. I really want it. Anticipatory chemicals. Right. Oh my God. And then I get it. Right. And so like I'll differentiate between masturbation and sex. Right. When I masturbate, I don't necessarily feel satisfied. That's one of the things that makes that such a whatever pursuit. Whereas when I have sex, I feel satisfied. Yeah. Like I there's some deeper thing in me. Yeah. And, and it, it, it is an extinguishing of the hunger, but because I have oxytocin and vasopressin, it's like, oh man, I feel yeah. so good. Right. So it's this combination of the calming of that, like seeking behavior right. with like, and I feel so bonded and connected to this person. Yeah, this is just terms. So uh, the way to think about it in, in this particular framework is pleasure versus enjoyment. Got it. Okay, so pleasure is you know something that pornography is associated with pleasure. Um, sexual activity in a in a in a pair bonded relationship is 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 associated with enjoyment because it has people and memory. And so one of the things to keep in mind, a strategy, especially for a lot of young people, a lot of young men, is to is to do, is if you like something, it's best if you're not doing it alone, because then you're probably full in stop. A, it not necessarily. This is just kind of a rule of thumb. This is not. A, this is not an iron law, but it's a mm -hmm. rule of thumb. Doing it alone is associated with pleasure. So you know, uh, um, Anheuser Busch doesn't do ads about beer, where they show a dude pounding a twelve pack alone in his apartment. Right? Why not? Be, because be that would be ad, that perhaps. would be. A, Per, yeah, because a lot of people use alcohol for pleasure, right. which leads to addiction and misery. They taught, they see, you know, you and me cracking open a Bud Light and clink and talking about how great it is and because we're friends and we're making mm -hmm. a memory. And that's enjoyment, which is associated with happiness. Mm -hmm. So we have, a, we have a, a basic idea that the same thing is true with the, the example of sex that you talked about a minute ago. You can, it can be pleasure or it can be enjoyment. And everybody knows the difference between sexual experiences that are pleasurable or enjoyable. Mm -hmm. and Enjoy, enjoyment is the goal because that's one of the macronutrients of happiness. We talk about in term the, in the terms that you define about satisfaction, but it's really a, in, in this terminology. And again, you know, you have to just defining terms. These are just words, but sure. the concepts underlying them are, are are critical. In the book, you give a really good example of pleasure without enjoyment. Yeah, uh, which you mentioned obliquely a minute ago. But when you think of a drug addict, yeah. They're doing the drug, right. they're theoretically getting the pleasure, but they're not getting any of the enjoyment. Right, they're getting tons of pleasure. It's because they're loading only on pleasure, mm. but no enjoyment because it's not social and it actually is not engaging the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus to create memory. And so you, 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 will, you simply will have a transient experience. Mm. And the transient experience will be unsatisfying and so you'll hit the lever again and again and again and again and it will lower your quality of life. So that's the key thing. If there's something you really, really love, so, for example, I'll, I'll ask people. People will talk about because you know, I've done a lot of work on the on the, the science of addiction, and it's a very interesting subject. People say, "How do you know 
if you're addicted because these are behavioral constructs you know you can't take a blood test to know if you're if you're an alcoholic mm, if you're you know that's it, interesting. so it's these are behavioral and the big behavioral thing is do you prefer to drink alone do you prefer to actually become inebriated alone that means you're looking for pleasure versus enjoyment and that is a mm. that that is has a lot that will lead you more to addiction more toward addiction and away from happiness is the way that that works that's the reason that people say never drink alone they don't know what they're saying is they're saying enjoy it don't have it be a source of pleasure because that's dangerous so that gives you an idea so we've talked a little bit about satisfaction talking a little bit about enjoyment these are heavy heavy topics in terms of the social science and neuroscience for sure and we haven't even touched on meaning which is the heaviest of them all which is the hardest of them all so you can become an a, what i really want is i want people to be to be obsessed with, to have their hobby be the science of happiness and how they can get it and spread it. Because that would be a, a really meritorious movement. If people were like, yeah, more of the science, more understanding it, I wanna be excellent at this. I wanna be most excellent. My hobby is getting better at happiness. And it's changed my life. It's a good hobby. It's really been it's a good hobby a good for career, me. Yeah, I made it into a career. That you most certainly did. Um, yeah. So I want to close the loop on the fulfillment recipe and get right. your take on that. So uh, you have to work really hard because that's just nature right. ensures that you're going to do that so that you're out doing the hard things like getting a meal, protecting your mm -hmm. family, et cetera. Uh, to acquire a set of skills, right. that's a big lean on progress because I agree progress, I think, is a foundational pillar of human happiness. Right. Uh, so you're going to work really hard to gain a set of skills that allow you to serve yourself and others. Right. And it needs to be in a way that you find exciting. Uh -huh. So that to me is, those are the things that nature is going to ensure that you do. And if you're the doing it for not only yourself, but others is the meaning portion of this. Right. Um, why do, is it that people never stop to identify what gives them meaning? Is it that they confuse meaning? Is that they're stuck in the me self? Why do so few people so few people end up cracking that code? Part of the reason is because they're not specifically trying to find meaning. They don't make it a goal. They just they, they, they a lot of people believe that if I do what I'm really really good at and I can be successful at that it's going to give me a ton of meaning automatically mm -hmm. and that's not right. Like anything else, you have to do things on purpose. Did you get meaning when you were a classical musician? No. That was the reason. That's the reason I'm not a classical Could musician. you have gotten meaning out of it? Many people do, but here's the thing: I, I, my, my favorite composer is Johann Sebastian Bach. Mm. Maybe the greatest composer who ever lived. That's a great story. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 1685 to 1750, 20 kids. He had 20 kids. Yeah, yeah. He was a pr he was productive as a composer and I as a father. I would say was he Catholic. He wasn't. He was Lutheran. <laughs> but um, but he was. Uh, <clears throat> I say that because I know you're Catholic. For yeah, those listening he, who wonder why I made a joke, he about was just a sexy Lutheran. But right. in, in in Bach was asked near the end of his life why he wrote music it the why question you know our our friend simon sinek he always talks about start with why and it's fantastic mm. i mean it's been because it, it really is you know people are going around asking what and hoping to get the why for free and simon's entrepreneurial twist is start with why and then the what will come automatically and you'll be a lot more satisfied because you'll find the source of meaning so box why when he was asked why do you write music was the aim and final end of all music is the refreshment of the soul and the glorification of God. Okay, not bad, not bad. Not bad at all. But I read that in my late 20s when I was still, I was in the Barcelona Symphony in those days. And it's a good job. And it was, you know, I love the music. It's really into it. It's kind of a high prestige job, you know, playing the greatest. It still sounds cool. It sounds cool, sounds cool, yeah. But I couldn't, I couldn't answer like that. I couldn't answer like that. I didn't feel like I was refreshing souls, particularly. I certainly didn't feel like I was glorifying God. I was you kinda, built that in though, because this is know. one thing I always think people think they're going to find meaning. It wasn't my thing. It meaning. just wasn't my thing. Hmm. And so I went in search of something where I could answer my why question, like Bach. I and I became a social became, scientist. That was the that thing? was it because you know when I, I because I, after that you also you you go on to run the think tank after that right right yeah so I got my PhD I actually finished college a month before my thirtieth birthday mm -hmm. by correspondence so this is not a typical path to you know a professorship at Harvard obviously this is not typically the way it gets done this is a great country isn't it agreed I, I, yeah um, a kid from Puyallup can do this it's fantastic it's crazy I love that so. Um, 
and then I went and I, I got so interested when I was doing my, my bachelor's degree in, the, in human behavior and the fact that you can model it and you can study it that I, I, I went back and got my master's and PhD as a social scientist, as a quantitative social scientist. I was mm -hmm. doing, for a living, I was doing military operations research at the RAND Corporation for, you know, like secret stuff for the Air Force and all that, but, you know, using... And you felt the sense of meaning in all that? I was, what I felt the sense of meaning in was I was learning so much that was so critically interesting and I had a strong sense that I was gonna, I was learning how to ask and answer original questions about human behavior that were gonna push the boundary of what we knew so that people's lives could get better. I had a very strong sense that it was going to, it was in the offing, it was going to take decades. Was the part about so people's lives could be better, was that a critical, was critical. part of that? It was a critical thing. Okay. To earn my success, I needed to do something where my work created value in my life and the life of other people. Mm. That's I what think I that like that I is so do. big. And look, you cover this in the book, so I know yeah. this isn't mysterious to you, but yeah. uh, focusing outward. Like if you want to be happy, we don't need, this is me paraphrasing you again, we don't need self-care, we need other care. Right. And I just have learned uh, through unfortunate trial and error that if I'm doing something only for me, it, I'll run ashore on the me, me, me problem. Totally, totally. And, and so you get into the me self world, mm -hmm. it's all me self. You know, other care is I self. It's I'm gonna look outward at what other people need. I'm gonna be thinking more about them, which gets me away from the, the boring, repetitive tedium of the me, me, me soundtrack to begin with. I mean, it has, I mean, it's just simple. You're, you're distracted from the stuff that's so boring and yet so um, uh, you look at so obsessively over the course of your life. So that's critically important. And you find, I mean, again, there's tons and tons of studies that actually show that the more you give, the happier you get. The more you give, the richer you get. The more you give, the better looking you are. It's a, it's a wonderful study. What? It's all perception. So there's this one study where these guys, these social psychologists, they they bring men, it's a, it, men into the lab who are partnered. And it's all heterosexual couples and they bring them in. Some have been dating for six months and some have been married for 50 years. And the, the guy's in white lab coats. And they say, okay, it's a simple experiment. I'm gonna, sir, I'm gonna give you these coins, put them in your pocket. You and your wife or girlfriend, you're gonna walk down this little path to that other building down there and my colleague is going to interview you, and then you get to keep the money. That's it. Like, okay. So I walk down this little path outside, and there's an alleyway between the buildings, and this homeless guy comes ambling out of the alley and panhandles the husband or boyfriend. He's a confederate to the experiment, obviously. He says, hey, you got some change? He does. They know he does because they put the right. money in his pocket, yeah, and he yeah. has to make a decision in front of his wife on whether he's going to help the homeless guy. They get to the other building and the first question in the interview is, did you help the homeless guy? How much did you give him? And then the second question is to the wife, how attractive do you find him right now? The more you support the homeless guy, the hotter she finds you. That's so interesting. <laughs> That's the reason on a first date, you're like, I love humanity. I support, uh, I, you know, I build houses for the poor. Yeah. I love dogs. I love babies. You're trying to look like, you know, Albert Schweitzer on a first date. That's hilarious. <laughs> Cause you're more handsome. That is very interesting. Okay, so um, we know that being outward focused is gonna be beneficial, but you were talking about um, you needed to find the answer to your why. What is gonna be that thing that right. I could answer in the way that Bach does? I find in life, basically nobody finds that. Like that, that is so rare. Right. Uh, and when they do find it, it ends up being very transient. Right. So how did you navigate because you're for people that don't know we we did another interview which right. i highly encourage them to go watch and so we covered this i don't want to tread uh, a ton of the same ground but i think it's worth telling people you've would you say that your career has been spiral yeah for sure okay you gave me the language mine right. has for sure yeah um i i it's interesting you make me question whether that's just my personality and i was going to end up there no matter what mm -hmm. or if it really was what i the story i've told myself my entire life which is i did all of this just to get into storytelling and i needed to control the assets maybe maybe we'll get into that <laughs> well, those are later. that's those are endogenous to each other yeah maybe yeah but I, what i want to know now is did your why run out and that's why you reinvented yourself? Did it just migrate? Like how have you kept that alive in your life? I, I took opportunities that were put in my path that I thought were in line with this vision of how I was trying to grow. So I had a intention, but I didn't have attachment. Mm -hmm. So when I was a French horn player, leaving that becoming a social scientist, I, I had an intention to do this work on human behavior to 
as it, to help myself and others, to make life better, to increase love and happiness in mm -hmm. other people's lives. But I was not attached to what manifestation that was going to take. And that's what I urge all young people to do, to have a virtuous, beautiful intention with that attachment with respect to the, the expression that it's going to take at any particular time. I taught for a number of years. I loved it. Super great. Then I thought I should run something that I think is going to be good for humanity and for society. You know, and so I ran this think tank, this big think tank in Washington, D.C. I had 300 employees. Mostly I just raised money. I had to raise $50 million a year to keep the doors open. And it was a thrilling experience. It was exhausting to be sure. But what I was trying to do was to use my background as a social scientist to create better public policy, to hire really good people that was going to, to make the country and the world freer and better with an emphasis on opportunity for people at the margins of society, which is what my think tank was engaged in. After about 10 years, I knew I was getting stale, man. I was getting stale. So I had the same intention, but I had no attachment to Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute. That, was a, that would be a disordered attachment because that's not who I am. I'm Arthur Brooks. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a child of God. And I am put on earth to lift people up in bonds of love and happiness using science and ideas. What's the next assignment? What's the next assignment? And the next assignment was to do what I do now, which is I have a company that teach, writes, speaks, and teaches widely and does media on the science of happiness to popularize, to see the world as a classroom in an enormous course of study of the science of happiness to lift people up. And that, you know, so I can, I have, I have a column in the Atlantic and I write books and I get to talk to you and I get to travel and speak and teach at course. Harvard and it's phenomenal, but that's, no, I'm not attached mm. because I know this is not the last assignment. I have intention, but the attachment, no, 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 no. The attachment's the killer of all of these things. And, and you too. It's like, mm -mm, next assignment, please. Mm. But here's the direction we're going in. I need to do this thing. This thing is going to serve. And when you're really in the zone, it's, it's a thrill. It's a thrill. You just can't get it off of it when you're really in the zone too. But it's not because you're going for the thrill. It's because you're going for the value. You want, the, you want to hit that vein of value, right? And when you run that vein out, then you go look for it, you dig a new mine. What does it mean to run the vein out though? So, um, okay, how pure was your move into the, the think tank? Because you talk about idols. I've listened to enough of your content. I know mm -hmm. what your idol is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we share an idol. Um, so I, I, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Yeah. So I don't know that having an idol is bad. I have a feeling that it's nature's way of getting us moving and making us an active species. And it is and you how can we use it for great good. Right. Exactly. But if it's the end goal, if an idol of money or power or pleasure or fame is the end goal will be unto you and will be unto the world. Mm. But if it's an intermediate goal to lifting people up and bringing them together, if you can use the prestige that you have in your job and the admiration of other people to get them interested in something that's truly generative and good and improve their lives, which by the way, you're doing with the show, right? I mean, you've got lots of prestige, you're a famous guy, mm. but you're using it so that people will watch it and change their lives. So this is the yeah. end goal, it's a problem. If it's an intermediate goal, then it's good. I wanna uh, restate this in my language to see if I really understand right. this. Okay, so the me self is getting caught up in my emotions. I'm confusing the emotion for the perception of the emotion. So knowing that in the brain, pain and suffering are two separate spaces, mm -hmm. knowing literally two different regions of the brain, I'm not making that up for people listening. Uh, and then uh, in meditation, I am to your point earlier about uh, the bitter coffee, there's a difference between um, my knee hurts and witnessing that I'm having a sensation in my knee that right. one might articulate. Or my knee hurts pain. versus I don't like how my knee feels. Right. That's Probably really the big difference way because you know it's my knee hurts. It's a, that's a statement of fact. Right. Right. It's a signal. And the one last thing I'll wrap on that to see if I really get this. So uh, Viktor Frankl talked about the gap between stimulus and response. Right. Now for people that haven't heard that name, he was in a concentration camp, lost his wife, mom, dad. I mean, just unimaginable amounts of loss. Right. And s came out of it, psychiatrist came out, or actually I think a, a psychiatrist and he was a psychiatrist and, and a psychoanalyst. Okay. Which Perfect. is an interesting combination. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh -huh. Writes a book 
about that time, basically saying, if you could find meaning in your suffering, that you could make it. But if you lost that sense, he was like, you could literally predict when somebody would die because once they gave up and they could no longer associate meaning with why they were going through the suffering, that was it. Right. And so that idea of there's this gap between stimulus and response and you get to decide mm -hmm. how you interpret that thing is everything. Right. Is that what you're talking about? When that gap goes away, you're now in me territory. Yeah. So. So there's there's so much in this, and and you know we've referred to the you know the new book, and there's a, the whole front part of this new book is emotional self management based on the science of how your brain gives you signals that are called emotions, getting away from the idea that bad emotions are unfortunate, we should get rid of them, and or that unhappiness for them is bad, and we should get rid of it. So understanding the science of how this works and what these things are for, and then being able to learn, grow, and manage the feelings that we want, such that we can adapt best to the current world and we can make growth toward happierness mm. that's that's the whole uh, front part of this book the back half is okay now that you've done that build the life you want build the life you the want yeah co-authored with oprah winfrey exactly right exactly right it's um, a good book by the way i'm glad you like it thank you it's um it was a joy to write it it's a joy writing a book with oprah winfrey mm. too what an experience it was really an interesting experience to and and recording the book the audio book too because you keep thinking Oh, I know that voice. Mm. <laughs> Not mine. So, um, so, so emotional self-management comes down to number one, uh, understanding that emotions that you have are not just nice to have and bad to have. All they are are signals. They're like a machine. The machine of your brain perceives outside stimuli and turns it into a universal language that can that can send signals to the neocortex of your brain. The out outside wrinkly area of your brain, especially the prefrontal cortex, which is the most modern part of the human brain, to send it signals so that you can decide how to react according to them. And it doesn't matter what language you speak or where you grew up, you everybody gets the same signals. They get the basic emotions of joy, of interest, which are the two positive basic emotions, the negative emotions, which doesn't mean that they're bad, just means that they're negative, mm -hmm. anger, disgust, sadness, fear. And all those things are then blended together into these complex emotions. So anger and disgust, you blend them together, you get contempt, which is the conviction of the worthlessness of something. And so it's, it's this multiplicity of emotions that we get, they exist to send signals, universal signals, and then we get to decide how to react. Here's the problem. Most people don't take that opportunity. Most people take their emotions as given, regret them, like them, and act according to them without doing that last trick, that last entrepreneurial trick, which is deciding how to react. You get mm -hmm. to decide. This is Viktor Frankl's point. The book is Man's Search for Meaning. And what he learned in the concentration camp was that all these bad things are happening and good things happen in life, you decide how you're going to react to these things. That's the ultimate entrepreneurial task of human life is deciding how you're going to use the resources under your control. And the first set of resources you get are your emotions. Okay, so the time between the stimulus and response, the time between the, the emotions and the reactions that you decide, that's the gap that Viktor Frankl is talking about. You want that to be as wide as possible. That's why and every time you have an emotion, the most important thing to do is to not react, is to, get, is to practice not reacting when you feel something, good or bad. Wait. Tell, tell me why, because this is where I see people get lost all the, all time. the time. They trust their emotions. Yeah. They think their emotions are right. They are a map of actual reality and that if you feel angry, you should act angry. Yeah, and that's, 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 that's a great way to live an unhappy life and make other people unhappy around you. I agree so violently, yeah. I can't even tell you. Yeah, yeah, and think about all the times when you're building your companies that, that you, you felt something negative and if you just yelled it, you snapped at somebody or said that was on your mind, you would have done catastrophic brain damage Correct. to your company. It would have been terrible. And instead, as, or you get that email, you know, you get an email and, and it's like, I want, I want to, I want to answer right yeah. now. Don't never answer a bad email on the day you get it. Never just have an automatic. As a matter of fact, have somebody who's managing your email for you. So you don't see them. Mm -hmm. you, you see them and then you think about it, but you can't answer it because it disappears from your inbox for 24 hours. Make a deal with somebody. Why? Because you want to, you want to your, your, your prefrontal cortex to be in charge. You don't want your limbic system to be in charge. It's a two year old, you know, when kids, when you have little kids and you know, I have, I have grown kids, but now I have grandchildren and, and they yell. 
And, and what you tell little kids always is use your words. What you're telling them is put more time between stimulus and response mm -hmm. and choose the response that you want. You're not going to say that to a little kid. You're going to say something that's truncated, like use your words. You, and, and people who are reactive, what we say as social scientists, we call them limbic people because they're, they're acting according to their limbic system. This mm -hmm. is the most unentrepreneurial thing to do. That's basically like, I got a dollar, I spent a dollar. No, 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 no. Revenue comes in, you decide what to do. Should you invest it? Should you distribute it? Should you buy something with it? What should you do? That, that's what good entrepreneurs do with their lives, but that's how we need to see our emotions. So that's the most important point. Now, what you do in that gap is called metacognition. And this is where it gets really, really interesting. In that gap, the best thing that you can possibly do is to think about the emotions that you're feeling, what they mean, and how best to use them. So that, and, and this, is, this is really the engagement of your prefrontal cortex. That's what meditation practices tell you to do. This is what prayer helps you to do. This is what walking in nature helps you to do. So all these metacognitive practices, this is what therapy is supposed to do too, by the way. It's supposed to give you expertise in expanding that gap. But then on top of that, there's all of these ideas that you can use. Once you, you've got this time, you can make these decisions. You can, you can substitute emotions. You can say, that's not the right emotion. Here's a better emotion. You can literally do that. How's that not just faking it? It's not. It's what it's. So, so for example, um, I work, um, I've talked a lot and, and I've been palling around lately with, you know, Rain Wilson, who's the you know, actor yeah, from The Office. Yeah, had him on the show. He's terrific. And, and we grew up, he grew up in Ballard. Yeah. Yeah. And so five miles away from me, he's just the same age as me. He was a classical musician, just like I was. Oh, I, I didn't, didn't know, know him. But we have Wait, parallel. Did he play like bassoon or he something? He played the bassoon. I played yeah, the French okay, horn. So we that. probably yeah, overlapped yeah. an all state band or something as we were kids. But we have the same childhood, basically. And so it's interesting. And so we really connect on this. But for example, he talks about the fact that most, uh, he believes that most comedians suffer from depression. Hmm. And one of the reasons they're such good comedians is because they choose the substitute emotion when they're feeling sadness of humor, which is also an appropriate response to things that are making you sad. You make them into a joke. And people think of it as a defense mechanism. No, it's an emotional substitution. You know, it's the, when you drink coffee, the, the, the caffeine molecule, it looks just like the adenosine molecule, which is a neuromodulator that, that is inhibitory. It makes you feel tired. It goes into the slot into the neuro, the receptor for the adenosine. And so you don't get adenosine. That's what makes you feel peppy. It blocks the thing that makes you feel tired. That's how caffeine works. Emotional substitution works in the same way. The humor molecule goes into the sadness receptor. But you can't do that unless you're taking time. You cannot do that unless you actually expand the time between stimulus and response until you understand exactly how the science works and, and getting as much time as you possibly can. Was that the angle that you took to understand the science or did you come at it from a God says that this is the way to go about life? I'm a scientist, you know, and one of the reasons that I am religious is because of my, because of what I've learned intellectually. So was, for me, that was the, the thing that freed me as well was, so I'm call it 22. I am very unhappy, like really scary, sliding towards depression, right. unhappy. And I started reading about the brain. Now I don't remember what gave me that impulse. It was probably something I learned in college plus Taoism, whatever, but it like really made me think about the way the brain worked. Mm. And I started reading about how brain plasticity was this hotly debated thing. And maybe you really could teach an old dog new tricks. And one day I just decided I'm going to act as if brain plasticity is real. Right. And then the more studies came out that showed that it really was real, right. like the more I felt like I could grab a hold of that, but it was, it was a science based insight that allowed me to really change the tenor of my entire life. For sure. For sure. I mean, it, it's interesting because people back when, when I was a kid, I'm you know ten years old, little ten years older than you. And when I was a kid, or even when people were older who, than me were coming through, that the whole idea was that biology is just psychology. Mm. You know that you can you can think bad things away, and that was supposed to be really incredibly empowering. Now, really, what we believe with the advent of you know the advances in neuroscience, you know, as a social scientist, I have to know tons of neuroscience. Teaching happiness is thirty percent neuroscience. What I teach, mm. I'm talking about the brain constantly. 
it's much more the case, we believe, that psychology is actually biology. Facts. And, and that sounds like it's not empowering, like this is all wow, determined. Super but empowering it's thing. super empowering because once you actually understand the process, you can intervene in the process. Correct. I talk to for young executives, for example, and I say one of the biggest threats to your career is an inappropriate sexual relationship in the workplace. Dude, it's that's one of so them. hilarious to me. It's, and, and, and so we say, so let's understand how this is gonna work. And you can psychologize it and say, you know, you need to be, and get, get some therapy. No, 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 no. What happens is that the first thing when you, have a, when you have attraction towards somebody who's a potential romantic partner, there's the first thing that happens is sex hormones with testosterone and estrogen. And in, in combination in both males and females, this is happening. The second thing that happens in the neurochemical cascade of falling in love is there's an up, um, and uh, there's a, uh, an increase in norepinephrine and dopamine so that you get the sense of euphoria and anticipation. The third thing that happens is a drop in serotonin. Now what happens when serotonin, a drop, a drop in, in, serotonin. in serotonin. Interesting. When serotonin drops, it makes you ruminate. That's the reason it's associated with clinical depression because of the rumination uh. procedure. It's, it's a, there's a part of the brain called the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which is incredibly active when you're ruminating. It, it's one of the things when you're ruminating on a business plan, on an opera, on a poem, on somebody who's rejected you, on, you know, and so it's, 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 you see it incredibly active in depression and creativity and falling in love mm -hmm. and all of these things that all have rumination, you know, iterative rumination involved in it. So, and it all is involved with a, a drop in serotonin, which is why you don't want to have that early stages of falling in love for the rest of your life, because you'll want to die. Oh. And then, and then the last thing you want to die, the early <laughs> stages of love made me feel like I'd never get anything done again. Yeah, yeah, it makes you feel out of control. Your brain in looks suspiciously way. like a an MRI addict, right? in the brain of a, a methamphetamine addict. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, that's how it felt. Yeah. I legitimately yeah. felt like I was on For sure. drugs. And then awesome. you get the tide, the warm tide that comes in of the increases in oxytocin, which mm. is a bonding neuropeptide that functions as a hormone of the brain. you get that before it's reciprocated? You, you, well, I mean, what it happens when you have eye contact with somebody in a love connection, Whoa. eye contact, so you're both getting it. The, the biggest bolus that you get of that is when you first lay eyes on, on eye contact with your newborn baby. Really? Yeah, it's just like 4th of July in your head. But anyway, so it's one, two, three, four. That's the neurochemical cascade. And the reason I bring this up is when I'm talking to young people in business, I say, if you do not intervene early enough in this neurochemical cascade, you're going to be in trouble because it'll be out of control. It'll be like, you know, no brakes on the roller coaster. And, and it's like, I have this incredible career and this incredible job. I don't know what happened. We slept together and now I'm fired. And you see it all the time. Like Harvard Business School case study. Uh, what happened? Well, they let the neurochemical cascade go too long and you have to intervene. Number one, don't put yourself in a position where you go to step two. Don't put yourself in a position where you go to step three. What are you doing? You're managing your brain. And if you don't know the brain science, you can't do that. That's why this stuff is so incredibly empowering. And when you read that stuff for the first time, you're like, oh, there's something I can do here. Now there's something I can use. It's not just psychology. Mm. Now it's something that's more tangible than that because the, the grandeur of this entire experience has a biological basis and one that I can understand and one I can, I can actually manage. Yeah, for me, being able to picture the thing, that helps a lot. Sure. Yeah, once I could understand um, the myelination process, I was like, oh, okay, now I get why this is something I need to repeat. Once I understood that the, the brain is a caloric hog, and from an evolutionary standpoint, that means anything that you do repeatedly, it's gonna hardwire just to make it more efficient. And so all of that coming together really allowed me to begin to Improve your habits, well. yeah, because sure. your habits, what they were doing was improving the management of the organ. Mm. And, and that was affecting your psychology and your effectiveness and your happiness and, and the whole, you know, the progress that you're making in your life. That's why in, the information is so critically important. That's why it can be so life-changing to learn science, mm. actually. For sure. So what are then the habits of happiness or maybe a better way, this is the language you use in the book, the macronutrients of yeah. happiness. Like yeah. what are those things that we want to begin building our lives around if we really want to thrive? So people define happiness in a lot of different ways, but the biggest mistake that people make, make is thinking that it's a feeling, that happiness is a feeling. Ooh, It's not a feeling. 
Happiness Isn't has, it? No, happiness has feelings associated with it. Okay. But to say that my Thanksgiving turkey has a smell is different than saying that the smell of the turkey is the Thanksgiving dinner. Right. Fair. So that's a really big distinction that it's important to make. So your Thanksgiving dinner is protein, carbohydrates, and fat. That's literally what your Thanksgiving dinner is. It also has a delicious smell that attracts you to it and that you want. And if it didn't have that, or had the wrong smell. It smelled like you were you know, microwaving trash when you walked into mom's house for Thanksgiving. You'd be like, uh, something's wrong here. So, but getting past the feelings on happiness is what will set you free to be able to manage it appropriately. Growing a business is hard. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve your margins. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free, netsuite.com slash theory. What I want to understand when you started the think tank and when you stopped, obviously, because we did the other interview and I know your other mm -hmm. book from strength to strength and I know the two big movements of somebody's life where you go from right. fluid intelligence to crystalline intelligence where you're really bringing wisdom to the table and that was your transitional moment right. between those two. So I understand all of that. But at the same time, I do wonder if um, there, there were just other things caught up in it and that maybe the either... I've heard you say you were no longer making progress when you were a French horn player, right. and that's what made you want to leave that. I'm wondering if you felt like you were no longer making progress in the think tank, and that's why you wanted to leave that. Like, is that the moment where we all go, oh, that's my cue now to find that next assignment? That's what we should use as a cue, the natural cadence of you know the value that you're creating you don't very very few people get to create more and more and more value in one exact thing over the course of their lives and we have an economy that accommodates change so it's really incumbent upon us to have our antennae up and pay attention to that because we want to be able to create that value and be open to the next assignment so yeah i mean my motives are never pure <laughs> because you know i'm just a guy and but i do have a process of discernment every philosophical and religious tradition has a process of discernment discernment is when you don't know what to do how you figure it out this is hard you know the decision making process and so i'll have students who are like I, I don't know should i do a startup or go work in investment banking or should I marry this person or not? Or should I go to law school or stay at work? Or, or some, some things are even more personal and, and, and delicate and di difficult. But at any particular time, a third of the people who are watching us are agonizing over a particular decision. Mm. So the question is, how do you make these difficult decisions? And every philosophical tradition has a process on how to make a decision. And here's the key thing that they all have in common. You got to do the work. And to do the work means you need to think about it it doesn't mean you need to think about a particular thing. You need to think about that decision process every day. What are you thinking about? So when I have students that have, haven't even begun this process, mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, 15 minutes a day. I want you to start by sitting alone at your desk, no music, no phone is not there. Write lists of things you like. You got to start getting in touch with the things that are attractive to you. Because some people are completely even divorced from that. They have no, they're so far away from being able to discern what they want to do that they don't even know what they like. And so mm -hmm. just starting to write places I've gone that I really enjoyed. And not because you're deciding where to go next, but just because you're trying to get that in order in your head. What are the things that are attractive to me? What are the things that I actually like? Um, I'll tell people that they have, that they should, to be thinking about just the process, to let the, discernment happen you have to be very quiet and very concerted in the effort to do so to walk for an hour before dawn every day with no devices hmm. and to do that so people who are really religious i'll say 15 minutes a day praying about this to be given the discernment to be given proper discernment 15 minutes a day on your knees so and or, or meditation just, practice there's lots of ways the to do the difference this. between prayer and meditation is there one well, there's lots of forms of prayer and lots of forms of meditation. Mm. So there are a lot of meditation techniques, single point meditation, analytical meditation, um, uh, meditation of compassion, all different sort of and, and 
uh, Theravada but and Mahayana prayer, traditions. Et are you trying to make your best case to God, or are you just repeating an idea in your head, like "Please grant me the discernment to understand what I should do in this moment"? So there are different ways to do it. There are different forms of prayer, even Christian prayer, even mm -hmm. Catholic prayer, which is what I engage in. So every night I pray 25 minutes, which is called the Rosary, a thousand-year-old meditative prayer before I go to sleep every night, and that's a, a repeated thing you prayer. Repeat. And that it's a thing that you repeat while you're meditating on particular mysteries that happened in biblical tradition. And what are you doing? You're focusing, you're, you're seeing your life through the lens of these great stories. And what that does is helps you understand yourself better and all kinds of insight, insight comes to you over the context of this process. That's a kind of a centering prayer. There are other prayers that are called, uh, you know, mental prayer, which the Buddhists call analytical meditation. The Dalai Lama wakes up every morning <clears throat> and the first two hours are analytical meditation where he'll just think deeply about a passage in Tibetan Buddhist scripture. He's thinking about it. He's not reading it. He's written down a few lines and he's looking at it and thinking about it for two hours. It gets 88 and he's doing that for the first two hours of every day. That's analytical meditation. That's not just like looking at a flame or doing soul cycle or something. That's not, he's, and that's, a, that's also meditation, incredibly important. Mental prayer is the same thing where you'll read a passage of scripture whether your scripture is the, the suttas or the New Testament or whatever your thing is, and you read it and you say, and, and you say, what is this meaning to me? Where am I in this? How is this impacting my life? Two sentences, 15 minutes, more. It's crazy how much insight you can actually get from that. There's compassionate meditation or compassionate prayer where you, you bring into your mind the people that are giving you struggle and you think about, you visualize good things happening to them and you ask God or you ask the cosmos that good things, that, that blessings be rained down upon them and you change the nature of your orientation toward them. The biggest reason that you have enmity with other people is because of your enmity toward them, not theirs toward you, typically. Mm -hmm. And you can literally change that. And this is one of the techniques for doing so. So different kinds of prayer and meditation, they have different functions, but we have to use them as such and not just be kind of like, all right, like, like a little kid, like, God, I sure hope I get an A on that exam. Can you please help me get an A on that exam? You have to be a grown up about this stuff. Mm. And it's super exciting. And it, so that's the process of discernment when you're trying to figure out what to do is you have to concentrate on it. The, the ancient Greeks called it sunesis. Um, in the Pali Buddhist tradition, in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, it's called panna. And in this discernment of spirits in Ignatian Catholic spirituality, every tradition has it where you're focused on it, focused on it, focused on it for a particular period of time. If you do the work where you're focused on the decision, looking for the insight for 15 minutes a day for two months, you'll have clarity. That's the guarantee. It's amazing. Hmm. But the reason that people can't get clarity is because they don't do the work. Hmm. They, they don't do the analysis. Sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Uh, Walk me through the idols. What yeah. what are the idols and how do we use them well instead of being used by them? So this is a tradition that comes from um, Neoplatonism, sort of from Plato, as best stated by his great pupil Aristotle, and then translated into the Islamic, Jewish, and Christian traditions in the Middle Ages. So Averroes, who is the you know the the the, the Muslim philosopher from 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 southern Spain. Um, uh, uh, Moshe ben Mamon, Maimonides, and Thomas Aquinas. So these are the, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, these are the great figures of this. And they really, they, they translated Aristotle into saying that uh, uh, Aristotle was the greatest of all the social scientists. Hmm. I mean, to, to, I realize I'm cheapening Aristotle in this way by saying it, but it's, it's kind of a conceit that everybody you love is like, Tom, you're a great social scientist. That's like the ultimate compliment from a social scientist. So by the way, you're a very good social scientist. So, kind. and he, and so for example, Aquinas said that there's four substitutes for God that he, he believed as did Averroes and, and Maimonides and all of the, the monotheistic religious leaders that what we ultimately want is God. Now, atheists watching us or agnostic disagree with that, but we all want something. Can you define what that means then? To define, to want God? Yeah, because I uh, I have a feeling even atheists want a thing to yeah. fit that God-shaped hole, but yeah. I've never taken the time for myself to define what the God-shaped hole is. Yeah. So I'd love to know. Yeah, so this is, is the thing, for example, the, the, you're looking for something that's defined by your craving. You know, when you're, when you're really, really hungry, it, it proves the existence of food. When you're really, really horny, it proves the existence of sex, right? And so when you really, really are seeking 
the complex singularity, mm. the source of all truth, the cosmic oneness is proof that it exists. But what is it? But what is it? Okay, so that's what different traditions have been trying to explain for mm. the longest time. This is really interesting though, by the way. I don't want to just let that roll past. Yeah. Yeah. Hunger is the proof that there is food. Yeah. The desire for sex is the proof that there is sex. Yeah. The desire for or it's this evidence thing. that there is sex. It's, made, it's not yeah. a proof in the classical sense, but it's evidence Fair that it exists. Evidence. And so it would be really, really, really weird if you had a craving for something and that the object of the exist. craving didn't exist. It doesn't yeah. really make sense. Yeah. And so if you have a craving oh, for the oneness, Arthur Brooks, yeah. this is good. Yeah. And this is, by the way, this is one of the reasons that when all of the conversations that we're having about AI, mm. they're all misguided. AI can't give us what we want. It can't. Because all it does is gives us complicating engineering solutions for a simulacrum for the thing that we're, for a simulation for the thing that we really, really want, which is a different species of problem. You know, what we really want is the, is the object of all the complexity of the universe. Complexity is simple to understand and impossible to solve. Complication is hard to solve, but possible. Mm. All of the reasons that all these things that we do in tech that are that promise everything and deliver nothing but loneliness, the reason is because they're com complicated solutions to complex needs. Love is complex. It's very easy to understand and impossible to figure out. Your cat is complex. Very simple, but impossible to know what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. All the things we really want in life, all of our deep desires are complex. All of our solutions are complicated. And we're, we're throwing complicated solutions at complex problems and we're not getting happier. And so the only way that we can do this is to take quiet time in contemplation of the complex. That's the solution. Now, are you going to find it? No, no. But it's just like happiness. You're not going to find it. You're going to make progress toward it. The goal, the, 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 the metaphysical goal, the transcendental goal of a spiritual or philosophical life is the approach to the complex oneness, to the ultimate truth that we crave. And you got to do the work. Stop distracting yourself with social media. Stop distracting yourself by saying, if I make the money, then everything will be okay. Or if I have the prestige, and this gets us back to the idols. Aquinas said that we crave God. But, we'll, but God is complex and hard to understand and has all kinds of demands and, and winds us up in all sorts of one-sided conversations. And, uh, and so we take a complicated solution to the complex problem and things that are kind of God-like. You know, social media is kind of social life-like, which is why when we're lonely, we'll binge it, but it doesn't help. Mm. And the, the social media equivalent for what we want in God, according to Aquinas, is fourfold money power pleasure and honor by which he meant fame or admiration or prestige that's what he said that the four things and those are the idols and everybody's got their idol that when they're not on their game looking for the cosmic oneness despite the fact that they'll never find it they'll say okay fine i'm tired i'm gonna go do that thing that's a that's a simulation for it and and it always runs you in the wrong direction it runs you in the wrong direction and only when you know what your idol is can you actually manage yourself? So you say, oh, I'm doing that again. I'm doing that again. I'm looking for money again when what I really wanted was love. I'm looking for admiration again when what I really wanted was enlightenment. Because you didn't want to do the work for enlightenment, so you went and did the easy thing, which was getting the idol. Mm. So is, is enlightenment a stand-in for God? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole, the whole point is that these are, enlightenment is something, enlightenment would be what Christians or Muslims would call the beatific vision, which is to lay, finally lay your eyes on the face of God, mm. which is actual truth. If you're a Buddhist, it means because you finally understand. And you're sitting under the Bodhi tree and you, you, finally have this, you finally get it, is what it comes to. You know, we, in the monotheistic traditions, we don't believe you get it on this side of death. Buddhists think that you actually can achieve it, but be that as it may, I mean, uh, I don't know. I have my hypothesis, <laughs> but I am, I do know that we're all move. We all need to move toward it. We all need to do the work toward it and getting, getting the AI is not going to do it any more than Facebook. It's interesting is do that it. you're linking, cause I don't think of AI as God, but I hear a lot of people talk about that, that it will end up being godlike. So it's interesting if they really are 
looking for that in AI. I think what I'm looking for- trying to fill the for, whole godlike hole with it is all yeah, I'm saying. So yeah, so I, I will grant you that for anybody doing that, that would be a tremendous mistake. And I'll give you my thesis on what I think yeah. all this is in a second. But AI, I think for me anyway, it is, it is to finally get answers to the complex which may be your entire definition my, of God. My, that's, an, that's an exercise in futility. That's interesting. I yeah. don't know that I would agree with that. So I feel like, and look, I don't have, uh, the data that I have to back up the following is, is merely physics. Right. As we that's not bad. grow, huh? Well, <laughs> we don't understand physics. Simple that, physics. That's, yeah. <laughs> the, the reason I bring that up is because as we strip layers off that onion, it unlocks things that we couldn't do before. Right. And all of us have grown up in a world where Einsteinian, Einsteinian, whichever way you would say uh -huh. that, physics already exist. Yeah. And not realizing that before that it was Newtonian physics right. and that the shift between the two unlocked right. the modern world. Right. And you know, we think of him as just sort of this crazy haired guy and we forget that so many of the things that we rely on in the modern world required us to understand that breakthrough, but it isn't the universal principle yet. We haven't gotten there. We haven't got Higgs boson, which will, which will show, which will render Einsteinian physics obsolete in all kinds of ways. Fingers crossed. So as we begin to unlock these things and truly understand them, it, it really does open up avenues of um, technology. Now, one has to be careful not to view technology as a god, but if we can use AI to either augment our own intelligence or for it to itself be intelligent. Now I'm wildly conflicted about uh -huh. AI. Let me be abundantly clear. We all I'm, are. Yeah, yes, deploying it as fast as I can. Uh -huh. And me at too. the same time, I'm terrified. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but I want those answers have real world implications. That's yeah. the moral of my story. Yeah, 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 for sure. Absolutely, they do. But the point is that they, that AI and all of these particular tools, they solve a different species of problem. Yeah, they are not going to answer the God. They're not hole. going to because they can't. And the whole idea is that there's always this concept that we could understand everything if we had sufficient computational horsepower. Mm -hmm. But that's not right. Because you can't solve comp complex problems which are mathematically different than complicated problems. Yes, give me an example of, so for people that don't know, yeah. you did applied mathematics for a while, so yeah. this is not me asking some random yeah. guy off the street. Yeah. Give me an example of- A um, complex and a complicated problem? Yes, because yeah. in math, the only thing I can think of, because I am wildly ignorant, I would like right. to be abundantly clear, right. but from my just not knowing math at all perspective, right. the only category of thing in math that I know as being complex would be something like the uh, pi. Right. So pi is, uh, if Yosha Bach is correct, better understood as a function rather right. than a number because right. you can never know the final right. digit of pi. It's a relationship. Interesting. Yeah, it's a relationship. But but f so I'll give you an example. Is, of two. is that complex? Yeah, well, it, it's a good question whether or not it's complex or not. I think about it in a slightly different way. So I'll give you an example that might um, that might make it clearer. So a complicated problem is one that has, you know, 75 equations and 75 unknowns. It's a highly dimensional mathematical problem that it would just take tons of computational horsepower to, to, to figure out, but there is a solution. Mm. Designing a jet engine um, is an incredibly complicated problem. Making a toaster is a complicated problem. You know, if you try to do one out in your garage with you know stuff that's sitting around your house, you'll probably burn your house down if you try to make toast with it. It's a very complicated thing to do. But once you do it, you can do it over and over and over again with almost complete accuracy. Mm -hmm. That's a, these are complex, complicated problems. A complex problem is a football game. A football game is a complicated problem where I don't care how good your computer is, you're not going to be able to tell me the outcome. Because that it's has complex. It's complex. Right. It's a, it's, I think I misspoke. You it's, said complicated know, once but, and complex yeah, once, but yeah, complex. Yeah. It's a complex problem. A complex problem is incredibly simple to understand the outcome. You know, the Patriots score higher than the Broncos. That's, uh, you know, the natural order of things. <laughs> that, they, that it's just one team has a higher score than the other and wins. Very simple, incredibly simple. Um, but it's unbelievably the permutations are so vast that you can't you can't simulate it. You and can't, you don't think that's knowable with enough computation. It's not knowable with enough computation. But actually, and, and even if that one turns out to be that turns out to be not a complex problem, but a complicated problem. There are complex problems like the problem of love. The problem of love is very simple. 
and yet it's not something that you can simulate in any real way. And some people will say, well, you have your AI girlfriend. That's a, that's a, you've, you've cracked the code of love. No, you haven't. There's no, there's nobody watching us right now. It's like, yeah, AI girlfriend just as good. No, no. AI yes. girlfriend, a substitute, because I can't get the real thing, mm. is what it would come down to. That's the difference between pornography and, 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 and sex with your wife. All right. When two smart people who are well-meaning think the other person is crazy, you know they have different base assumptions. Yeah. So to me, that sounds crazy. Uh -huh. And the reason is that I believe we're in a deterministic universe. Yeah. I'm guessing you do not. I don't believe we're in a deterministic universe. I believe in a stochastic universe. Okay, define stochastic. Stochastic means there's randomness in the universe. My father was a biostatistician, a PhD biostatistician, and he was a devout Christian. I said, what gives, dad? You know, I'm an adolescent, what gives? And he said, you don't understand. He said, you know what miracles are? And, he, and I said, what? He said, events that are five standard deviations away from the mean. They're way out on the tails of the, of, the, of the curves. You know, the greatest gift that God ever gave the world was, was a distribution, a random a distribution of events. He believed, and I think it's actually more than plausible, I think it's most likely that the universe is actually has randomness in it, which means it cannot be, you can't get to a single point on most of the, or any of the complex problems. You can't, and so you can simulate a kind of a version of a, a curve fit, but you can't actually get underneath them and simulate them properly because we have a stochastic universe and we live with deterministic brains. Our brains say that this happens to this and this happens to this. We have a supercomputer that's good enough. We can figure out all, how it all hangs together. And that's the, the supposition behind Einsteinian physics or, or, or Newtonian physics. That these are that there's a deterministic structure underneath that we're we're simulating. We're doing the best that we can to put a model on top. It's a map, but that's actually probably not the way that the universe works. And if that's the case, and if we have a craving for the source of that, then it's some thing, some one, some entity that can be the 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 origin of that complexity per se. What is it? What is it? You know, it's like maybe my model, which is, yeah, I got the Bible and I got God and I got that whole thing. Maybe that's nuts. Maybe it's nuts. But it's, it's a hypothesis. And it says that we can't get it from the stuff. We can't get it from the stuff. You can only get it by looking for it, looking for the true thing. And that's the reason I think that really great intellectual life requires that we have both a, an intellectual pursuit and a spiritual pursuit and that we need to undertake these things in parallel. I think that's the only responsible course of action. What's happening when you're looking for it? Like I can give you, I, I don't know that Buddhists would agree with this, but I think they would. Uh, what you're getting by looking at it in a Buddhist or looking for it right. in a Buddhist tradition is you're getting out from under the illusion of uh, perception. Right. If that, that's definitely a Western look at it, uh, but that feels pretty accurate. Um, that's a good way of explaining it. That's a good way of explaining Buddhist thinking yeah. on it, that you're no longer bound by the illusions. What, what in the language that we're developing here, you're no longer bound by your models. You're actually able to see the road as opposed to staring at the map mm. all the time. It's like, you know, when we're looking at that, we got our devices and we're looking at the, the GPS. If you just stare at the GPS, you're going to crash in your car. You're actually driving on a road in real physical life, but you're more and more and more divorced from that when you're stuck with the, with the, with the models. And those are the illusions that they would say that you're trying to free yourself from by actually imbibing some of the, the oxygen in, the, in mm -hmm. real life around you. Okay, so if that's the Buddhist take on it, what is the Catholic take on it the catholic take on it is very similar which is that there is underlying reality but that underlying reality is not always apparent and for all sorts of reasons I and mean, that the underlying reality is um made by god and yeah it is the realm of god and that we're not we just don't have the capacity or the you know the preparation to be able to experience no plato talked about this he was pre-christian Plato talked about this, about the, his analogy in, of the, the shadows on the cave wall. Mm -hmm. The closest that we can get to actually seeing what's going on is the shadows of what's going on behind the fire in the cave wall. Um, the, a lot of the, the uh, German philosophers from the 17th and 18th centuries and 19th centuries would talk about this too. So the Schopenhauer, for example, Arthur Schopenhauer, was obviously one of the greatest early 19th century, mid 19th century philosophers would talk about villa, which was, you know, the sense of will that the reality exists, but we can't see it because we're just not 
competent and we're trying to put one foot in front of another. And so we create an, an edifice that, that allows us to live, but we can't actually see the reality that the, the complex reality is happening behind it all the time. What do you the think these guys were struggling with? And maybe you're, from your perspective, the obvious answer is just God, but I don't know if it's just God. I mean, that's a word for it. They were struggling for something. They had a craving. Because here, here is the modern take on that. Mm. Uh, you're in a simulation. Right. Now, some people believe you're in a literal computer simulation. Right. And other people like me, mm, I don't necessarily have evidence that you're in an actual computer simulation, but I do have evidence that your brain is simulating reality as a way so that you can grapple with it. Because right. instead of seeing blue, if you just saw the number of photons in a given wavelength that are reflecting off that surface and into your eye, it's so complicated. Mm -hmm. So your brain is just taking this incredibly complex universe, which by the way, for people that don't know, the human, uh, our ability to perceive the actual electromagnetic spectrum is 0.0035%. Yeah. So you're like way, way less than half a percent. And tons of dimensionality of doesn't exist. Yeah, there's exactly. tons of things we can't see. So we, we've taken this gigantically complex thing. We know there are things thing. we can't see. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we boil it down into something that is just an absolute right. sliver of the reality. So, okay, in a modern context, I get it. But like, what were they coming up against in whatever 2000 years ago when Plato is describing the shadows on the cave wall? What is he grappling with? Like it's, <clears throat> as far as I can tell, he's, he's getting underneath, like realizing, oh, my perceptions do not equate to reality. And once you accept that, like everything begins to unwind. Well, it doesn't begin to unwind. It begins to free you to this understanding that you're- that, You begin that you, to see its illusions. You begin to see that you are living in a world of illusion. Now, how is this, that, that we can militate against that by saying it's all of, in a simulation. And part of the simulation is that we're simulated, the simulation creates the illusion that there is something bigger, even though there isn't. Mm. But that's just explaining something away. So in a philosophical basis, the way I talk about this with my students, I say, okay, we got three, we got three choices, <clears throat> three doors to go through Monty. This is, for, you know, for those of our, that's the, the Monty Hall game in economics is based on let's make a deal, this old game show that was on when I was a kid, right? And you get the, the, the contestants would have to choose one of these three doors and then the door would open up and it would turn out you either got a car or you got a living room set or you got a goat yeah or something like that <laughs> so there's three there's basically three choices about that about how you're going to see the the existence of, uh, of an underlying reality that you can or cannot perceive and you can or cannot get closer to and make progress toward it has to do with the two concepts of essence and existence we believe, we all believe that we exist. I mean, you can relax that by saying it's a simulation. We don't actually exist, I don't know, but let's leave that for a moment. And let's just say that we all agree that there's existence. What we don't agree on is the, the nature of essence. Essence is meaning. So I'm alive and my life has meaning. Okay, now the, 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 the traditional philosophical understanding, the Platonic understanding of this, the ancient Greek understanding of this, the Christian, Jewish, um, Hindu, um, Muslim, for sure, understanding of this is that essence precedes existence. Let's think about that for a second. The meaning of your life existed before you were born. Your job is to live up to that meaning, to find that meaning and live up to that meaning. It existed. It's a cosmic thing. That's what comes from the cosmic oneness. The modern existentialist view, modern philosophy, a lot of it would say that as that existence precedes essence. You're born without any meaning. You have to invent meaning the best you can. Good luck. Mm. That's Sartre. It's like go sit in a French cafe and smoke filterless cigarettes and feel depressed. As existence precedes essence. Now, the third, the middle way, the most depressing way is the Nietzschean way, which is the nihilistic way that says existence exists and essence doesn't. There is no meaning. The only responsible course of action in a life is to give up on essence. There is no meaning. Stop looking for God. Stop looking for enlightenment. Stop looking for all of it. That Would craving he have that said you, had, you couldn't apply meaning? He said there is no meaning. There is no meaning. Life has no meaning. So you can't apply, because the first one is there is no meaning, but you can apply meaning. That there, no, the first one is that there is meaning. You need to find it and live up to I it. I see. So the second is that there is no meaning until you create it. And the last is that there is no meaning. Got it. And you can keep looking for it and you can keep trying to create it, but that's childish. Let it go. Let it go. 
that's nihilism. That's why we call, you know, somebody who's nihilistic, somebody who believes that there is no meaning and nothing matters. Mm. That's the reason we call it that in the, in the popular vernacular. So these are the kind of the three choices that we have to walk through. Most, for most of all of existence of humanity, it's been door number one, which is that there is essence. And then we experience existence. And the whole point of life is to figure out and pursue essence of in a responsible and in, in, in a way that's generative and meaningful. And that's what we're trying to do. That's, that's what I think is most compelling. I think that's the most compelling view. I don't, I don't know the truth, you know? And, and, and by the way, when I've talked to Sam Harris about this, he agrees with me that there's things that we don't see, that there is essence that we, we can only barely perceive. And, and all of the things that I talk about, from Catholicism to the stochastic nature of the statistical set of circumstances in which we find ourselves, from the science to the religion, is my understanding, my best understanding, my fumbling around in the dark and looking at shadows on the cave wall for what I'm trying to do to, to find the essence that will give me meaning, give meaning to my existence. Mm. That's the point of my life. It's very interesting. So uh, it goes back to what are we grappling with here? So uh, I'm going to define my version of what I think the God-shaped hole is. Yeah. And I'm going to put it in the context of the language we've been using here. So, because I come at everything from an evolutionary lens. Right. And I'm very much of it's the It's a good camp. lens, by the way. Thank you. It really helps you understand a lot. It has been very helpful. Evolutionary psychology life. is just the best. It's bizarrely yeah. controversial, which I will never understand. Mm. but. Uh, nonetheless, it has been extremely useful in my life. So I come at it from that. So I'm like, okay, if we do have this hole and it is um, a yearning and that yearning is evidence that there is something, what what is the nature of the yearning and what is the thing that I'm yearning for? Right. And again, using the language of this conversation, um, I have a feeling that humans have a, um, a very intrinsic evolutionarily derived desire to kneel before something. Mm. And now the question becomes, okay, if you have this push to kneel before something, why, what, what is the evolutionary advantage to those that kneel before the thing? Mm. And the best answer that I can come up with is that you need to get out of the me self and you need to get into the I self and you need to create that distance and by kneeling before something, by put, making something bigger than you, now one, you just you are in the habit of living your life in service of something beyond yourself. Right. I don't think this is definitely just ignorance. So you will help me here. Mm -hmm. I don't think that any of the world's lasting religions would compel you to serve anything other than ah, oh, this will be interesting i actually don't know the answer to this question i will be very shocked if you tell me that any lasting religion has asked people to serve anything other than either humanity itself or a god that loves humanity is there no doubt there are no doubt there are religions that that but they're that but, i guess but you stipulated to lasting religions yeah because i don't see yeah. how that would be beneficial because what Ultimately, what I'm saying is the proxy, the God-shaped hole is actually a desire to serve your fellow man because that's going to be the thing that keeps you alive because you're way better off coming together that's as a group. That's the evolutionary. Yes, yeah. is my gut. And then religion, like the specific, whether oral or written tradition, is the thing that allowed humans to come together in gigantic swaths in a way right. that no other species, no other creature, not ants, nothing can come together in the flexible fashion that we can right. by using ideas right. of religion like those just give you an instant bond and i'm yeah. willing to kill for and die for this thing that we have in common yeah yeah so it's um i also have a huge amount of time and admiration for evolutionary psychology but it's totally descriptive and it's not it's, it's neither prescriptive nor deterministic so I don't believe that the evolutionary psychology of the things that actually set out our impulses and imperatives, that they, that they prescribe nor proscribe particular behavior. I think that we have choices way beyond our evolution. So let me give an example. Um, we talked about mother nature. She has really two goals for you. And all of evolutionary psychology comes down to survival and, and gene, gene propagation. 
that's what all of you know the the evolutionary psychologists and evolutionary biologists they say that all that the that that any organism exists for is to survive long enough to pass on its genes mm. and so it all comes down to that but virtually everybody believes that we can short circuit that and make decisions that go beyond that we can do all and so people will say okay well you laid down your life for a stranger but that was because you had some evolutionary impulse to behave in an altruistic way that that dates back to a time when that would have been better for your tribe etc 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 i think that the better explanation for that is the animal path versus the divine path the animal path is incredibly powerful it's a it's a wonderful model for understanding why most things happen and why we have the impulses that we do but the most interesting questions are the divine path where we actually make decisions that are that are, that go beyond the what the, our evolutionary evolution would suggest is the best path for us that go beyond the things that we want to do that 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 help us to understand that there could actually be something bigger and and this is the really unique thing about the human species is that we can make this election between divine and animal divine and animal and every day is this election between divine and animal and in fact to look for the source of the complex oneness in a world of complex ingenuity a com- complicated ingenuity that's to choose the divine path ultimately the divine path or the animal path in the biggest way so not everybody agrees with me a lot of really smart people disagree with me and say all the things that we actually do, they still come back to evolution. Even if they don't look like this is an evolutionarily adaptive thing to do, it, it sort of is. You just need a more complicated understanding of the evolutionary impulse. I disagree. I think that there's, man, evolutionary biology, it just puts us on this track and makes us act in particular ways. And yeah, we got all these habits, the things that we want to do, and then we can decide not to do them because we want something higher, because we're called to something higher, because we have a, a dim perception of something that's bigger, that something that's better, that we're drawn toward. And that's the, the, the oneness that we're distracted from when we're basically just sitting on the animal path and doing money, power, pleasure, fame, money, power, pleasure, fame. And so instead of getting on our knees and contemplating the, the nature of enlightenment, we'll you know scroll Instagram. That's interesting. So as somebody who believes that you can't be enlightened prior to death, um, what is it about the contemplation of that knowing you will never be able to actually understand it? What is it about the contemplation that makes your life better? I presume progress, the progress principle, you're getting closer, you're getting closer. And why not? Why would God want it such that you can't attain enlightenment? Because, well, according to Christian yeah, yeah, yeah. theology, I mean, so this becomes a theological question. It's because ultimately it's the relationship, the beatific vision is the relationship with God, him, him or herself. And, you know, the, the way that the Hindus talk about this, by the way, is that the transmigration of the soul occurs as people are getting closer and closer to enlightenment, at which point the soul will be reabsorbed into the Godhead. So the idea of the soul for Hindus is that your soul, Tom's soul, is a little chip of God comes down, enters a human being, corrupted by circumstance, etc., becomes perfected over a hundred or a thousand lifetimes, and this is reabsorbed into the Godhead. And the ultimate goal of to stop samsara, the endless cycle of birth and rebirth, is to be reabsorbed into God. Mm-hmm. Is the way that so th- th- their their understanding of this is actually easier to understand, weirdly, than just I got to see God. Awesome. You know, I don't know. It's, but it's all basically saying the same thing, getting closer, getting closer, making progress. This is the goal in life. This is the impulse. And how do we do that? All kinds of ways that our lives are generative and help us do that. You know, as, as silly as, you know, doing a podcast, starting a business, all these things, they help other people. They help us understand ourselves. They make life, they, they lessen the burden for our brothers and sisters in particular ways. This is the reason that it's so profoundly unsatisfying for you to do something that's all me, 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 as opposed to others, others, others. And ultimately you get the juice of, of, the, of these generative things, of these creative things that you're doing when it, when it really does lighten the load and, and improve the lives of other people because that's the process of getting closer, the process of getting closer and the physical manifestations of the things that we do every day and it gets better. And we hope, and again, this is one theory. I mean, my whole religion, I might be completely off base. I mean, I can't say because I have no data. I can only hypothesize at this point. Faith is belief without data is belief without evidence. 
it's uh, it's not a set of, a set of non-testable hypotheses is what it comes down to and it's just that the progress per se is the point of what we're trying to do on earth that's what the cer certainly the dalai lama would say about the you know the from life to life toward enlightenment that's what the hindus would say about the transmigration of the soul for the reabsorption of the godhead that's what Hindus, or that's what Buddhists, sorry, uh, Muslims and Christians would say about trying to actually go to live in heaven with God. But it's all saying the same thing fundamentally about the progress. The, the progress is the point of life. Yeah, I don't know why at this point in my life this has become such a fascinating question. You're right um, on schedule, by the way. Yeah. No, no, seriously, no, because what you, you, what, what you, you throw off superstition and you, you look for the pure oxygen of enlightenment. And what looks like, uh, you know, Jesus and Santa Claus, what's the difference? You know, when you're 20, when you're 50, you're going, ah, big difference. Yeah, it's interesting. There is, um, there's something about the way that the world is moving. So my goal in life is to, in a really practical way, help people um, live a life live a life of fulfillment. And I, I never quite know how to put words to it. it fulfillment survives grief. And so I'm trying to, um, I have thought a lot about in my own life and have found tremendous easing of suffering in recognizing what I call that there is an evolutionary impulse to get me to do the things that will uh, align myself with having kids that survive long enough to have kids, right? And so while I don't have to do that literally, mm -hmm. I have to understand what the algorithms are that are running in my mind to make that happen. And um, the more I explore this space of like how one clicks into fulfillment, I do find myself grappling with it as you get under perception and you really start to say, okay, what, what is the bedrock here? Um, it does become, I'll say quasi religious because I don't find myself going, oh, I'm getting closer and closer to God. That isn't what it feels like from my mm -hmm. perspective. From my perspective, it feels like there is ground truth mm -hmm. and you can get closer to it. And the more you understand how the illusion is created, the less you are trapped by it. Mm -hmm. And the less you are trapped by the matrix to use mm -hmm. a very uh, fun word, evocative way of thinking about it's, it. It's one of the most profound movies over the past 30 years, notwithstanding I, the cinematography, it has to do with the, it has to do with the concepts oh, underneath it. A hundred percent. It, it, for me, it is the most useful metaphor for the human existence. And so once I understand how the matrix works, then I start seeing it in everything. Yeah. I start seeing it in um, politics, which is not something I thought I would ever engage with. I start seeing it in the culture war, another thing I never thought I would engage with. But as I, oh, I forget what this is a reference to, this is a, a, an allusion to something. As I set aside childish things, mm -hmm. I really come to realize that- You just quoted St. Paul. Is that what it is? Yeah. That's hilarious. I can't even tell <laughs> yeah. you where from, yeah. but mm -hmm. uh, that you begin to realize, oh, this is one problem. Yeah. And once you understand it's one problem that manifests in all these weird ways, yeah. helping people get yeah. deeper on that ladder, mm -hmm. because helping people get deeper on that ladder uh, becomes is is very meaningful to me. It's obviously also self-serving in that the deeper on the ladder I go, the more grounded I feel, the more uh, I feel resilient to the slings and arrows of life, the more I feel like facing death isn't scary. Um, just all the things, all the things. Totally. But <clears throat> I am, I don't know what to make of the fact that when I started all of this, it was a lot easier to have conversations about think like this, act like this. Uh, and then finding people wouldn't do it. And every time I tried to scratch as to, okay, where were all my own hangups, that it, it has led to me circling around this problem of the God-shaped hole over and over mm -hmm. and over. Mm -hmm. It's uh, mm -hmm. very fascinating. Yeah, no, it is. And this is, I mean, psychologists and sociologists have found that pattern that it tends to occur, particularly with people who, are, who live in their heads, people who are questioners that they start asking bigger and deeper questions and the answers that typically come to them, even with the with um, with greatest horsepower that the world can provide, doesn't give them the truth that they seek. It just doesn't give you full flavor. It doesn't give you, you get lots of interesting solutions. Like, yeah, I got, I got a good morning routine. You know, it's really good. I have the ice bath, you know, workout, whatever happens. It's just not good. 
but it's not the thing that I'm seeking. You keep finding answers to questions that you weren't asking and you're not finding the solutions to the questions that you really were asking that are inchoate. You know, you don't even know quite how to put words to these questions because the complex is so hard to apprehend that you don't even, you can't even, you don't even know the questions, let alone the answers. Mm. But that's what you're grappling toward. And that's, I believe that's what humans are grappling toward. That's what Aquinas was saying, that we all want the thing, but we'll like, all right, I'll take the substitute. All right, I'll take the substitute. And people start to freak out about dying if they've been taking the substitute, the counterfeit, money, power, pleasure, fame their whole life because they're running out of time and they haven't made any progress because they've been you know, eating non-nutritious food and not getting, and they're starving to death. And, and it's just, they get, people get into a panic in their life and they realize they get into this, deep existential dread, this ennui that comes from, you know, the depression of the world that comes because there aren't any answers. And maybe Nietzsche was right. And and they were just looking in the wrong place. So that's what I see. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm endlessly interested and enthusiastic about the, about the promise of AI, but I'm not kidding myself for a second to think that it's going to answer the real questions that I have mm. and that real people have and the really, the real things that people want it's funny because, you know, the one thing that we really all want, we don't have the technology for, and we're not getting closer to it. You know, the, the, the happiness that everybody really wants, it's not sold on the internet. Mm. It's not provided by the government. You know, we've got lunar landers and TikTok videos and you name it. We can invent anything. The ingenuity is almost boundless, but we're not getting closer to the thing that we want because the ingenuity is being deployed toward complicated ends as opposed to the answers to complex problems. We're answering the wrong set of questions is what it comes down to. And that's why you can find people who have everything in the world and are still miserable. They, they couldn't get it there. They couldn't buy what they wanted in that store. Mm. It's the way that it works. Interesting, the Dalai Lama and I had a conversation about this because he and I have worked together in various projects for the last 11 years. Wow. And we had this conversation about it. He says, you know, he's musing at this one point. When the Dalai Lama muses, you listen. And it's like... It's funny because, you know, the, the, you, you Westerners, you know, you've done everything to create v economic value and tremendous businesses and incredible wealth. And it's so wonderful to give people all this opportunity so they don't starve to death and, you know, the world is richer and all that. But, but you spent no time actually trying to understand the nature of what really matters the most. He says, we're poorer. Yeah. Our societies are poorer in the East, but we spent all our time and all our ingenuity trying to get the source of pure truth. <laughs> did they make any more progress than we did? I'm not sure. But also it's interesting because a lot of Buddhists will look at Christianity and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, we used to believe that 4,000 years ago. <laughs> that's a, that's a, a rudimentary theological technology. You're on the right road but you're way, way back compared to where we were. Yeah, we used to have a guy. Yeah, we used to have a guy, you know, and the whole thing, as opposed to these are different religions trying to get at the same ideas in different ways. They think there's a natural progression of enlightenment that happens to people and societies, and we're thousands of years behind where they are, despite, mm -hmm. the, despite the fact that we're hundreds of years ahead economically, or thousands of years behind in terms of spiritual enlightenment, complex versus complicated, same idea. Hmm. I don't know if it's true. That is the question. Uh -huh. All right, let's reground this for yeah. a second. So, this has gotten pretty heavy, man. Yeah. I've, I've never had a conversation like this before. Yeah, this is on a, uh, on, in, in media. This is amazing. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, assuming that the audience is still with us, let's uh, <laughs> let's reground this. So, in the book, you talk about um, what it is exactly that people need to. Um, come back together. So you talk about the four pillars to build the life you want. Right. Um, what are those four pillars? And if I can contextualize this, why does modern technology seem to move us in the exact opposite direction? Yeah. So what we want is love. That's what we want. Um, and, and, and once again, the world gives us complicated things. We want complex things. Love is complex. How do you get love? Love of the divine or love of, you know, truth, love of your family, love with friendship. The, the point of intersection between family and friendship is romantic love. So that crosses both those categories. And love of everybody is instantiated in the way you earn your daily bread, which is work. So the way that we needed the portfolio, the pillars 
or the investment portfolio for happiness that we all need is to spend every day thinking about the way that we're going to make progress in our faith or philosophy, whether it's religious or not, family life, friendship, real friends, not deal friends. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the modern world gives us lots of deal friends, but not very many real friends, which are, you know, real friends, deal friends are, are useful to us. Real friends are useless. That's, and that's why we don't spend a lot of time on them. And then work that serves is what it comes down to. So those are the silos, those are the deposits, those are the accounts that we need to put investment in every single day. And if we don't, we're gonna be, we're gonna be missing things. We're, we're, gonna, we're not gonna be as happy as we could be, and we're not gonna be building a stable and steady um, happiness that will, that will improve our lives and help us make progress as we go through life. So those are the four things. It's just a very practical matter. Um, I set people on, I can actually set up a course of action. Most people watching us are very good at working. You know, nobody's watching Impact Theory who's a total slacker. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I don't think I'm just gonna sit around all day, but I'm watching Impact Theory. No, you wanna be better at what you do. So everybody watching us has got, his work is pretty on point. And okay, and, and it's creating value and it's cool stuff. Generally speaking, it's gonna be cool stuff. You're, you know, you've got a cool stuff audience, good. But are you working on your philosophical life? Are you reading the Stoics? Are you walking in nature without devices? Are you studying the work of Johann Sebastian Bach? Are you engaged in a meditation practice? Are you practicing the religion of your youth? You need to do something like that every day. I, re I recommend at least 15 minutes of wisdom reading every day. Stuff you don't need to read, but you, your soul needs it, 15 minutes a day. And I have a whole you know list of books I that I recommend. Say, to toss people. out yeah. a couple. Well, I'll toss out a couple. Um, depending on what 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 tradition you want to start in, you know, somebody who is interested in all Eastern and Western and very questioning and open to all different ideas. I would I would recommend the Way of a Pilgrim, which is written by an uh, an anonymous Russian Orthodox monk in the 19th century. Way of a pilgrim. The Way of a Pilgrim. And what he is, he's just walking around Russia, having adventures, saying one prayer over and over and over again. It's a meditative book you're reading it. And it's just like, the more you read it, it turns into a page turner. It's the most boring book ever and it turns into a page turner. Zen and the Art of Archery, which actually explains Zen through the activity of archery, through the eyes of a Westerner. So it's a very good way to begin to understand Zen thinking. Zen is the most I self thing ever because it's nothing more than an attitude of observation. That's what Zen really is. It's a stripped thing compared to Tibetan Buddhism. All the Buddhists are going to you know, put in the comment section how crazy and wrong and wrong headed I am on that. Um, I would recommend The Miracle of Mindfulness by Thich Nhat Hanh, which talks about what is mindfulness. It's being alive right now and how you can actually do that. And there's countless numbers of these things and there's any number that we could, if you want, if you want fiction that falls into this category is Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. Mm. That is the most spiritual and intellectually, psychologically rich book I've ever read. Mm. Dostoevsky is philosophy, right? So it's kind of like people were reading Atlas Shrugged because they wanted, they wanted objectivist philosophy in the form of a novel. If you want the essence of the search for the complex oneness in the force of in the form of a novel, Brothers Karamazov by by Fyodor Dostoevsky. It's great. And so there's, there's reading. Second thing is family life. Again, we talked about that before. There's one reason to have schism in your family, and that's abuse. Everything else requires work. The big reason that people drift away from their families is because they're just just lazy. They're just lazy. They just like I got to call mom. How was when was the last time I saw mom? And, do the work but it takes two to tango like if the person is just not investing like if you're you're trying to engage with your mom and oh my god yeah i know but the the point is that it, generally speaking it's an iterative process where you don't and she doesn't and you don't and she doesn't and you don't and she doesn't it's got to get restarted and doing the work actually though even the even even unilateral work even one-sided work is incredibly enriching for your happiness because the part about relationships that's best is the giving is not the getting. It's better if you're giving and getting, I get it. I mean, there's an equation, there's a dynamic situation, but even if you don't, it's better to do it than not to do it. Mm -hmm. Friendship is critically important, real friends, not deal friends. And that means the work that you have to do is not pecuniary. I have people I work with who are real friends, but they started as real friends and we just look for an excuse to spend more time together and that's how they became deal friends mm -hmm. too. 
But the whole point is, you know, the people that you grew up with, often people went, they went to college with, if they went to college. And, you know, my, I have a son in the military and his buddies in the military, they're his real friends. I mean, they've literally saved his life. And, and he can't lose touch with those people. I guess that's the ultimate deal, right? <laughs> in, saving, in saving your life. And then, and then last but not least, making sure that your work serves others and you earn your success. And that you're working to make sure if you're an entrepreneur or a CEO like you or me, that you're, the people who work for you can earn their success and serve others. Because they deserve to earn their success and serve others. Mm -hmm. And that's in the hands of the boss to a very large extent. That's the, that's the portfolio. And are you and either you're doing those things every day or you're not. Either you did your reading and called mom and your best friend, or you didn't. Right? And every day that you don't, you're just you're 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 weakening the pillars of your happiness. You're you're getting you're getting less competent in the serious business of building your life. I think you may have even said it in this episode, but life is an entrepreneurial yeah. game. It's a startup. Mm. It's a so startup. When I think about those different pillars, um, they're not necessarily like they don't seem like big, scary things. Uh, so how do we approach those from an entrepreneurial standpoint? Like, how do we make these more than just, oh, I checked in with my friend. I touched base with mom. I read a passage in the Bible. Like, how do we go beyond going through the motions and really do something meaningful. Yeah, well, to, to, to be more entrepreneurial about it, you have to actually in, in, induce risk. You have to inject risk into the proposition. See, one of the things about um, willingness and ability to take risk for outsized return, you, know, you can tell I've written a textbook on entrepreneurship. You know, it's like, this is what they all have in common, is this willingness and ability to take risk in exchange for outsized returns. Mm -hmm. Now, usually for entrepreneurs, the way they'll denominate it is green pieces of paper. But the truth is for the startup of your life, it's usually the denomination is love, is you're willing to take risk for oh, love. You, you said uh, either in the book or the interview, I wouldn't invest in an entrepreneur that was afraid to fall in love. That's exactly right. So that's one of the greatest examples for a lot of people who are watching us. Disproportionately, people who are watching us are gonna be people in their 20s, a lot of guys in their 20s, mm. the audience. Unless I dreadfully misperceive the audience. No, no, you're theory. close, yeah. And, you know, I know a lot of guys, my students, my graduate students at Harvard, who are willing to put $10 million of other people's capital at risk, or even their own, if they've got it. <clears throat> they're willing to, to take a big, scary job, but they're not willing to ask a girl out on a date. Like, what? And the answer is, to that conundrum, to that mystery, that riddle, is that they're not entrepreneurial in the part of the life that matters the most, which is their heart. You know, this is like if you're willing to put money at risk but not love at risk and self-esteem at risk, you're not you're not an entrepreneur and you're not gonna have an exciting life. You're just not. And and here's the interesting thing, you know, I had this <clears throat> I was talking to this guy. Here's how it worked. I was given a talk and I and I gave the analogy of entrepreneurship in the business of romantic love. And I said, I gave him a it was a group of, a big group of, of 20 somethings in Washington, DC. And I remember the day distinctly. And, and I said, here's your assignment. You got two weeks to tell somebody you love that person who doesn't know it. And if it's not scary, it's not the right person. Whoa. And maybe, by the way, God, maybe, it's your, maybe it's your dad. To. Maybe it's your dad. Uh, unfortunately, I love my dad to death. And yeah, tell no, him and you tell him that was easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but ah, for a lot of people, they have relationships scary. with their family. It's like, mm. I've never told you this, but I love you. And that's like scary and weird and awkward and etc. So it, it doesn't have to be a romantic love. Mm. But the whole point is, if it's not scary, it's not entrepreneurial enough. Okay, so this kid, kid, in his twenties, um, finds me on an airplane a couple of weeks later. Says, "I was at that speech in Washington D.C." And I can't get it out of my head. And I'm like, yeah. He says, so I'm literally on my way right now to Philadelphia to confess my love to a woman I've been secretly in love with for two weeks. Wow. For two months. Two, and, no, two years. Two years. I've been in love with this woman. I've never told her because I'm too afraid. And I'm going there right now because of your speech. And I'm like, wow. it's only a speech, man. Yeah. Bro, be careful. <laughs> I don't want to ruin his life. And, and, and I did said. Did you get a follow-up on this? I did. Okay, because I'm, so now I did, I'm already I did. engaged. I did. Like, I, I did. Know. I know. And, um. But I, not immediately. I gave him my email and I said a prayer for him and the girl. And I said, and the girl. And I, yeah, I said, let, let me know. And then I didn't hear from him. So I thought that was a bad sign. I run into him at a holiday party a few months later. And I say, remember me? He's like, yep. And I said, how did it go? And he said, she shot me down. 
and she introduced me to the man she was in love with, and it was Oof. awful. It was awful. I said I was very contrite. I said I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to mess you up. You know the whole thing. He says no. You understand. I've been meaning to email you to thank you. I said why? He said because that was the thing I was most afraid of in my life, and it happened, and I didn't die, right. and I'm never going to be afraid again. Wow. All how right. did you get? He's also not going to waste time on her. How? I mean, you're you you're a very successful entrepreneur. Not on your first venture. You know, I don't, you need it. It's like the, there's work out of uh, Northwestern, Kellogg, the, you know, the management school, mm. Northwestern, that's a you know, lesser university. And they, the work shows that the average entrepreneur has about four failures before their first success. And they learn from each one of these failures. Mm. And that's the basis of the success. You need to have at least four substantial heartbreaking rejections that i mean on average if that if startup data are any indication of the startup of life and that's an entrepreneurial life man put your heart on the line get it stomped on get rejected you need it you need to learn is what it comes down to and by the way life is more exciting when it actually does work out if you took a risk if you took a risk and you failed in the past, mm. you know, it's like, it's not that good if you didn't take a risk and got rich and you never tried anything hard before that, that didn't work. You know, part of the process is the adventure and part of the adventure is the pain. That's life. And, and we need to understand that in love, which is the way, way, way more important than business. Mm. That's well said. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, these days. So going back to the framing of the question where you've got modern technology is pulling us away. You've got the celebration of business. You've got money, money, money as a metric of success. And the thing I try to convince everybody is, look, somebody that's had the kind of success that most people only dream of nothing has come close to giving me as much joy, fulfillment, anything, protection from the downside, all of it, other than my marriage. Yeah. My marriage is the thing that I protect most fiercely. I am not worried about losing my money. I'm not worried about losing uh, accolades. I am terrified of losing my wife. Yeah, yeah, like, and, and, and the market can have a horrible day and you don't like it, but your wife is really mad at you and you're bummed. Yeah. yeah even, even if you know she's not gonna divorce you, you're bummed because you don't want the person you love the most to be upset with you. Mm. You want her to be happy with you. Because what's happened is basically like your stock market radically tanking. The stock market of what really matters in your life yeah. is the way that that works out. It's actually a really interesting way to think about it. Okay, so if that is the thing, yeah. if that's the thing that's going to really, the thing that we're pursuing is love in a bunch of different guises, but the relationship that's going to be most important to us is the relationship with our spouse, how do we do that well? Yeah. And let's start at the beginning. So yeah. one thing you've said is delete your dating apps. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, or, or, or you know, there, there are some people who you know wind up meeting their partner and getting married based on dating apps. But dating apps, the evidence suggests that it's making dating harder. It's why actually would that be true because it's making it harder to find somebody with you with whom you can have the complex connection that's appropriate for why? a couple of different reasons. Number one is the paradox of choice. So dating apps give you too much choice, hmm. and so what that means is that there's always something better. So are you saying settle? Yeah. Yeah. Well, part of the reason is because you're not going to find the perfect person. You're going to make the perfect relationship. Oof. That's Oof. the way Give me relationships more. Give me really more. work. You know, people think I'm going to find, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, magical thinking is a huge problem. Love at first sight doesn't exist and Agreed. soulmates don't exist. Facts. Right. I mean, I, I believe that God wants me to be with my wife, but that's an entirely different thing than saying that there was this, there was one woman in the world mm. and she lived in Barcelona and she was a little girl and I was growing up in Seattle and the whole, no, no, no circumstances were such that I met the person that was going, one of the people that could have been mm. perfect for me if I worked to make it perfect. And your wife is cool with that framing? Yeah, because she knows that that's what God wants us to do. She, we, you know, we, we believe that this is what God wants us to do. Mm. God puts people together and then puts a lot in our hands. We have free will and we have to, you know, part of making cosmic love-based progress is the things that we do in our relationship. This is the way that we work out the stuff of love in life is, is not, it's all perfect. Then you're in heaven automatically. Well, boring, that's boring. No, 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 progress, man. And you gotta make progress. One of the ways you make progress is the imperfect that you make as perfect as you can using your imperfect tools. And that's the, that's the exciting adventure that is a, a romantic relationship. And if, 
And if you start off with the idea that there's always something better because of magical thinking, and I'm going to find the perfect one if I keep swiping right, or left or whatever it is. What is it, left or right? I don't know, I've never yeah, used them. That's right, because you and I have been married men for yeah. a long time. But the, the, I'm 21, the, you're how many years? 32. Man, it's impressive. 32, yeah. Congratulations, yeah. Thanks. I, I am in awe of that. My wife's like, it's like 10 minutes, underwater. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, no, I like that's that. like being married to an old time comedian from the Catskills. It's nice. Except she's Spanish. Bum, bum. Yeah, yeah. S Spanish Jackie Mason. It's anyway, good. yeah. It's a good so, reference that yeah. no one in the audience got, but that's okay. <laughs> Google him. Anyway, so he's probably on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, Black and white. Maybe, yeah. yeah all, yes. All Jesus. Stuff, every, so that's days, number everything. one. The second reason, however, is that is that it and again, I'm not down on dating apps. I'm just not I'm not down I'm not down with how people use them typically. Interesting. People use this them for, feels like you're caveating. I am caveating for sure, because there's nothing that's good or bad but that thinking makes it so exactly right. Yeah. And so the big thinking error in apps is finding somebody who's who's completely compatible with us. Mm. The technology enables compatibility. The, the technology is enables you to find to find people who are more and more and more compatible that you couldn't on the mm -hmm. on the human market, and so that matchmakers your parents wouldn't find for you, or certainly blind dates or somebody you meet in a bar. You, you just you know it's a crapshoot for compatibility, mm -hmm. which is actually what you need. We're too compatible. Hmm. This is something that most people don't understand. That sounds crazy. Yeah, it, I know. And so, it, but but people will sort on their political views and their likes and their dislikes and you know physical characteristics. And what you find is that people that match up on compatibility, ex you know um, ex ante a priori in the dating market, they even look alike, right? And 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 that's a problem. You know, it's basically you wind up looking for somebody who's effectively your sibling, mm -hmm. which is my adult kids say is. Not hot. That's not hot. Not That's hot. Not hot. And so when people are looking for excess compatibility, they like the person less, they find them less attractive. What you need is a base of compatibility, which is lower than you think, uh -huh. and then tons of complementarity, which is interesting and sexy. Okay. You want now, difference. Yes. Agreed. In not some opposites. Estimates. Opposites don't attract. Where do you want, you're now confusing me, where do you want things to be where do you want to be compatible you need basics on non-negotiable values preach right okay. no, non-negotiable values negotiable values doesn't matter people think that too many values are non-negotiable that are mm. actually negotiable politics shouldn't be in there you should not sort on politics now 71 percent of political liberals say they won't date a conservative 41 percent of conservatives say they won't date a liberal which just shows that conservatives have lower standards politically than liberals <laughs> and or, or maybe it's men versus women or something like that i'm not going to look into that's the data more but the whole point is that that that's a that's that's a ridiculous barrier mm. that's a ridiculous barrier that just that's basically like classifying being a democrat or republican like being jewish or catholic or atheist it's interesting man like this is one area where where I'm with you in the abstract, but political stuff's gotten so weird. Right. People are so devout about it that that isn't interesting. Yeah. And the moment, nope. yeah. I don't want to be like, even, even I try not to be dogmatic, but <clears throat> even if I were, I'm not being dogmatic, if they're dogmatic, right. like that's not interesting to me. Yeah, I get it. And one of the best ways actually is what, what I recommend to my students, for example, is that they don't talk at all about politics for four dates. To see if yeah yeah to have I really am into you. It's not until dates. we get into that thing exactly right. So right. you don't actually so the dogma or something. And if you can start to fall in love, mm -hmm. suddenly you're less dogmatic. Yeah, you're less dogmatic about politics. And the person you're falling in love with, when they say something that you would have previously thought was a non-starter, was a deal breaker, it no longer is. Are you and your wife politically aligned? Kind of now, just because we've been together for so long. But you weren't in the beginning. No, she was Spanish. I mean, she was brought up in a, in, like in, a, in a, you know, a hard red atheist family, you know, really, really, you know, it's like complete socialists, you know, they were on the losing side of the Spanish Civil War and they were all atheists. She hadn't been to church since her first communion and interesting and she, i quietly she, assumed that was the th first thing you guys bonded over no, no, was no, religion. oh no way that was just like that was a 10-year project for me wow totally 10-year project for me it was huh. just, <laughs> but you know she when i met her she's like no i don't believe in marriage that's an antiquated institution doesn't make sense interesting. Like, we'll see we'll see i mean and i moved to barcelona to try to convince her to marry me how long were you guys together before you got married uh it well i hoped that it would be very short but it took me two years to close the deal okay from yeah. meet to married no from from moving to marriage okay how so long I'm, from meet to marry three okay. so we, we were apart for a year 
and I was, you I know, know right. And she didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any Spanish That's or Catalan. Crazy. And and so I thought I'm gonna. Ha the only I've, I had a premonition. I mean, I, I met her for a week, and I told my dad, I think, I think I'm gonna marry this girl. Whoa. He's like, can't wait to meet her. I'm like, yeah, I got some problems. And she doesn't. Uh, speak English. She doesn't live in the United States, and she doesn't believe in marriage. But uh, I think I think it's surmountable. Other than that, yeah. And uh, and so you know we kind of stayed in touch for a year, and then I I quit my job and I moved to Barcelona, took a job in the Barcelona Symphony because I had this I had this very strong sense. And by the way, maybe it didn't work out. It was an entrepreneurial thing to do, yeah. and I was twenty four, and it was okay. And then I worked on it and worked on it, learned the language, mm. um, and we were in love. And when I was 26 and I said, we have to get married. You have to marry me. She said, yes. And, you know, and then little by little by little, and you come together. See, the couples change, people change over the course of their lives. For sure. And couples change together. And the couples that don't do well change apart because say, of the hubris. Most people don't change together. There's too much pride is what comes from it. So what will happen is tons of difference at the very beginning. Lots of love glue, glues you together, and then you start to change together. The, the mm. ultimate goal, by the way, for a, a marriage a relationship that lasts, tons of passion. We talked about the neurochemical cascade of falling in love, of you know, love addiction. But within five years, what you need to be left with is what we call companionate love. Your goal mm. within five years to be, is to be best friends with the person. That's your goal. There's lots of passion in companionate love that also sounds not hot, you know? <laughs> Here's my companion, Mrs. Brooks. You know, no. <clears throat> Companionate love is this is the person that you'll be looking into her eyes on your dying day. Mm. And then who knows all your secrets, with whom you can be truly yourself, who really has your best interests at heart. That's what companionate love is. And not every relationship can get to that. But that's now, the what goal. do you think that what's the importance of keeping sex alive? So, because that's the that's the you know, a, f a physical bond that is the most intimate understanding of the of your relationships. It's an expression of your greatest intimacy. It's also so, it's also super fun. Yeah, A and B. Yeah, but, yeah, so but I it's the make expression sure that people of hear yeah, that. But, but you can have sex with people you're not in love with. You know, people do yes. that all the time too. Carfax. It's way, way, way more satisfying when it's in the, the expression of your greatest intimacy. Mm. That's why the happiest people have one sexual partner in a, in a given year. It doesn't mean one in your whole life. Interesting. It means one There's in a given year. There's actually been a study There's on a that? a study on that using the General Social Survey at the University of Chicago. Yep. Is that, to me, that just sounds like a proxy for committed relationship. Yeah, it, it is. And, and the greatest expression of the deep, deep, deep intimacy and commitment mm. is, is usually sex. Because when people ask Lisa and I, like, what's the secret to a long marriage? We always say, like, one of our top things, obviously communicate, but have a lot of sex. Mm. Like, you don't want to become roommates. Right. And there is something also, and I don't know what you think about this, but there's something about there's a, an electricity to crossing that line and there's one person that you cross that line yep. with and not having that like one for that just entire part of your life to die and for you to yeah. never have that thing ah, that well there's be tons of oxytocin brutal. that happens during sexual activity that yeah. you don't get otherwise as well and that bonds you together again and again. Mm. Look, there are other ways to get it too, by the way. So sex is not the only way. People often ask, is it bad that couples fight? And the answer is it's bad when they don't. Mm. And I mean, some people fight a lot. Some people fight a little. My wife and I fight a lot. We fight a lot. We have a lot of arguments. A because lot she's of, Spanish? Because, yeah, I mean, it's for them, it's just a form of communication, you know? <laughs> and there's nothing that's not on the surface. And and so that was hard. The first five or ten years, I was very aggrieved. Because you're not built like that. I'm American. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't do that growing up in the Pacific Northwest, did we? I mean, it was like... I, uh, yeah, that was not... Easy. Learning to fight well was a big thing yeah. I had to learn. But the key is about about that couples that never, never, never fight, they're missing out on some of the greatest source of, of, of intimacy. Because the friction is there and yeah, they're just not acknowledging it. Yeah, you're saying things that you think that you weren't saying before. And That's that interesting. Is I heard you say intimate. this before. Will you take a second to say that very clearly? Yeah. The, when, the when idea of... Of yeah. intimacy through fighting. Yeah. People often say, it's so weird, you know, after we have a big fight, then we, then we make love. Mm -hmm. As if it were makeup sex. I've never once done that. Yeah. I never do that. Are, are you in the mood for sex after you've been in a fight? Well, I'm it depends not. on how the fight resolves. Well, but the I whole don't point is once. that a lot of people do that. And the reason is because they're raw and intimate in their communication, sometimes for the first time in a long time. Okay. 
for the first time in a long time. So if you're the kind of couple that has a, you're not seeing each other very much because you're working mm. really hard and you're on the road and and you're not talking about things and a lot of tension is building up and so, and then finally you have a knockdown drag out fight and you're saying things that you think that 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 are deeply intimate, that are your deepest feelings that you would never say at work because you don't have the kind of relationship with other people, you don't want to demoralize them, you don't mm. have trust. You have enough trust and you say things that might be they might be cutting. They might be wounding, but they're deeply intimate. You have a, an intimate bond. You have a, 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 a spiritual bond with that other person because of the intimacy of the communication, even though it was wounding. That's really yeah. interesting. So I will say this. I have had moments where I was completely uninterested in sex until we had, I wouldn't even necessarily say fight because fight implies that it's like really fiery. Um, there was one big disagreement that my wife and I got into and it was really interesting the when we when I brought up the thing we happened to be in a swimming pool and so my wife likes me to hold her and walk her around the pool and it ended up being this amazing way to have this argument because it was really like hey I've been meaning to say this thing for a few days now here's how this thing made me feel like let's really get into it and we couldn't see each other's eyes and it made it way easier to have the conversation. So we were like cheek to cheek, but we couldn't see each other's eyes. So there, it just became easier to like get those things off of our For chest. Sure. It was really wonderful. But I, and so I didn't want to have sex until we had that conversation, but it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to run you upstairs. And like, I've never had that response. Like I don't, People are different for sure, for but it's important that you have those relationship moments. And those for might sure. be as bonding. Your fights might be as bonding for you as- When done well, are you- Yeah, for sure, I, and there's technique. There's yeah, technique. talk to me about, so- So my guess is that you're in a 21 year marriage and you're gonna be married till you die. Yes. You're gonna die, it's, I mean, till death till you part. For mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And um, so my guess is I could probably write a script for your fights based on that. And when, when something's not right, that the accusation is that we are having a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at a couple that's tenuous and ha really having trouble and really in danger, it's like you're doing something and Dude. it makes me feel a particular way. So important. Super important. And just changing the language because language change has very strong cognitive impact. So if you, you want your fights to be, you're going to fight. And it's important that you relate to each other and you're honest with each other, but you want it to stop actually creating so much brain damage. Mm. Just change the just change the the pronouns. That's the first thing to do is to change the pronouns in the fights. Don't say I and you. Start saying we and us. We and us. We have we have to do this thing. I mean, when, whenever we do this thing, we have a problem. And and you'll find you're stumbling across it at the very beginning. You'll find because it's because and you did this. We have this problem. We have this breakdown in communication because then you're trying to solve a problem together and mm -hmm. it's a joint problem you're trying to solve. And when you solve it, you've made progress together as opposed to I won and you lost. That's really super really important. And just yeah. using different pronouns starts, it can actually repair a multitude of problems. Something my wife and I do, and this has been really powerful for us, is we talk in insecurities when we get into an argument. Yeah. So if one of us is getting angry, it's like we have a shared understanding. If you're angry, it's because your insecurity has been tripped. So confess, like what's the insecurity? What's the thing that's bothering you? Right. So that you can get off of the surface level argument, which is usually very fruitless. And you can get down it's into something like stupid. Yeah. It's like you finish the milk or something. Right. Stupid. And yeah. you finish the milk without talking to me and it makes me feel unseen, whatever. And once you get down there, like, ooh, whoa, why is that making you feel unseen? And also that the person isn't just, I have an insecurity, you triggered it, shame on you. It's like, okay, I have an obligation to work on my insecurities. You have an obligation to care enough about me that you want to know, but I can't just be like, you have to deal with it. Right. I have an insecurity and mm -hmm. you better tread around it forever. Yeah. You're so. doing a lot right. I can tell you that. And this is one of the reasons that, you've, you, that you state so openly that your marriage is the most important thing in your life. Mm. It's, the, it's the central institution of your life. I For mean, sure. like this goes all bust. And, and by the way, this is gonna go bust. It's all gonna go bust, Yeah. right? But the one thing on your deathbed is Lisa. I mean, here's the problem. 
one of you is going to die first. Yes. Although if you ask my wife, she really wants us to die simultaneously. <laughs> yes. That would be like, she's like, I don't care if I die in a plane crash as long as you're next to me. And I'm like, what? What are you like, talking wait, about? Why are we both going down? Like if I have to die in a plane crash, I want you to be safe on the ground. She's like, no way. I'd want to be with you. So yeah, that, <laughs> she my says it out of love though. So it's, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, actually yeah. laugh like, about I it. I totally yeah. get where she's like, from. I sure hope you die in a plane crash right. with me. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. It's a, it's, but, but that's a, you know, this is an, is an issue, right? Because that you will be separated. Yeah. The data say that except under the oddest of circumstances, you'll be separated. Yep. Now, but what typically happens is really, really happy couples, except under conditions of bad luck, they tend to live a long time, have a long mm -hmm. marriage and one of them dies and then the other dies. That's crazy, man. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Because you have a joint life, you have a joint life yeah. together. The enterprise, it's the the startup. It's a your co-founders. Mm. The other thing that's really interesting too is that the, a lot of the relationships that do best are startups, not mergers. That's interesting. Yeah. Tell me more. Meaning so, meaning second that, marriage? No. Well, I mean, second marriages are sometimes they're really great, but the the marriages that <clears throat> that have the greatest likelihood of success, they're entered into earlier when you're both in life startup mode, mm. as opposed to it's I got my law degree and you got your PhD yeah. and you got your startup and I got my startup and I think we're, and we have separate bank accounts and now let's have a merger. Mm. Startups are more successful than mergers. There's in data on that. And in life. Oh yeah. And the worst of course Ooh. are hostile takeovers or acquisitions, but you know. Wow, okay, so. No, you can I, have a merger that works, yes. but you gotta go into it with your eyes open and make it as, as much of a startup as you can. Mm. Make, and that was, I don't recommend separate bank accounts. I don't recommend it. Really? Yeah, there's huge data showing that couples are more successful when they have joint bank accounts. Interesting, let me run something by you. Okay. So when Lisa and I first got together, um, we had enough difference in values that it was, I looked at the things that she spent money on and I thought they were dumb. Mm -hmm. She looked at the things I spent money on, she thought they were dumb. So what we did was we said, bills are joint, but spending is separate. Yeah. And so we put our money together and then we each had the exact same allowance. amount to spend. Yeah, and Good at the time, so when we got married, she certainly had more money than me because I was just absolutely broken in debt. Uh, but then when we got married, I was the only one with a job. And the one insight, and I wish I could track back to where I got this, but I was like, this because this is all pre-functional internet. The internet existed, but nobody was really using it right. for much. Um, and I said, okay, look, we're gonna come together, but the we're in this together. So whatever money I earn, it really is half yours. Right. And so we're gonna take care of all the bills together. We'll have the separate spending accounts um, and really have looked at everything in that way. Like when we started Impact Theory, um, the lawyers were like, who's gonna own 51%? And I was like, what are you talking about? And they said, you can't be 50-50, that's the ultimate divorce nightmare. And so my wife was like, you're obviously gonna work more than me, right. like you take the 51%. She's like, I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. And I was like, over my dead body, uh -huh. I was like, I need you to know to the core of your existence, this company, whatever. If something goes wrong with us, I have a problem. Yeah. If we're in a position where I'm like, thank God I have 51%, I've already lost everything. So 50-50. Right. Well, all you're saying is impact theory is an extension of Tom. And so therefore my life is 50-50 with you. So axiomatically impact theory is 50-50. Nice. And really what I wanted to say was impact theory is an extension of Tom and Lisa. Like right. this is a thing we are doing together. Mm -hmm. And even if we weren't, I mean, I suppose at that point I wouldn't have thought about it, but like if my wife betrayed me, mm -hmm. I'd still give her half my shit. Mm -hmm. Just be like, yeah, you, you love her. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, I don't know who I would have become yeah, no. had I not I been know. a startup with her. You're not I mean, prenuppy at all. No. Nah, and no. all you were doing is avoiding fights by you know having separate allowances. Yes. It's not the same Correct. thing. I mean, it's just that's just that's just prudent. Yes. Is the way that it works out. It's like, yeah, we, we're going to tend to fight over this, and and you know, we don't want me to accidentally sp take all the spending on you know giant chess pieces or you know or you know Batman statues or something. Video games. That was video the, games. Whatever the, the thing happens to thing, be, yeah. and so let's let's you know make it so this we just avoid a fight. Mm. Let's just simply avoid a fight, and that way you can I can laugh at the way you spend your money. You can laugh at the way I spend my money instead of feeling a source of resentment. But right. basically, saying my money, your money. My account, your account, my property, your mm. property. That's problematic from the very beginning. 
because what you're basically is you're planning for is the dissolution. Mm -hmm. You're planning for the, I mean, it's a union. And, and you know, the union of this is to say that we're, I mean, it's it, it, biblically, it's a, a man shall leave his parents and, and cleave to his wife. It's one flesh. I mean, the whole, in, in religious traditions, divorce is supposed to be like cutting off your arm. It's supposed to be that kind of, a, of I mean, I get, I get it. It happens sometimes. I get it. I, you know, I live in the real world. It happens sometimes. But for when you're doing it from a startup, you can't, you don't really understand yourself without Lisa. It's like, who's Tom? I don't know. Alone? Literally. Yeah, that's the thing. Now, not everybody can have that, you know, and I'm not saying people shouldn't, not everybody can, can be held to these standards because of the, the, the reality of things that have happened in their lives. And, you know, they, I talk to people who have been the victims of abuse mm. and, and addiction and criminal behavior yeah. and all of this. And, and they have a need for love in their life and they get married again and they have an established life and it doesn't have these per, per, perfect standards. Social science gives you the, the ideal circumstances, but not the only circumstances. Right. And so here's the key. When the circumstances are not ideal, you have to work consciously with your eyes open to make them as ideal as you can. Mm. So if you've got a merger on your hands, got a merger on your hands, good, you can make that work too but make it as, as startup-y as you can. Yeah, the thing I would encourage people is to understand that the reason a startup works is for a set of principles. If you understand the principles and can apply them later in life, so be it. One of them is going to be being open to being changed by the relationship, going right. into it and knowing we are creating a union. Right. And in doing that, like what are the ways that we have to move and to dance in this thing in order to make it work? Right. And then a big part of it, especially if you're older, is understanding that selection is 80% of the battle. Like if you select poorly, you're gonna be in dire circumstances. They, they are, I mean, again, without magical thinking, without thinking there is one soulmate, so choose wisely. Yeah, yeah, I that mean, there's, there's not, that's not the way to do it. I don't believe in soulmates, yeah. I don't believe in love yeah. at first sight. I'm just saying that if, for instance, you said earlier, you have to grow together as a couple. Now, mm -hmm. the amount of all the things that we talked about here, emotional stability, right. getting mm -hmm. that right, knowing how to fight well, like, I mean, there's just a laundry list of happiness things right. that if you get right, you will be way primed way prime for because a marriage. Knowledge is power in your relationships, in your work, in your spiritual life, knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And and again, it, it all goes back to, it's, I know people who you know say, yeah, we knew each other for a week and we got married in Vegas. It's like, that's folly. Yeah, that's, that's just serendipity that it you, you, that's just doesn't make sense. On the other hand, you know, when somebody says, I say, how long have you been dating that girl? It's like eight years. It's like, no, yeah, no, no. Um, and, and, you know, what's the right amount of time? This is what this is a question of prudential judgment, too. You know, my oldest son met his wife, now wife, when he was 24, early 24. They dated for six months. They were engaged for six months. They got married a year after they started dating. Mm. Their first child was born nine months later. Wow. I mean, that's called the six, six, nine cadence in Catholic life, by the way. Six, really? Yeah. That's a thing? That's a thing. Six months dating, six months engaged, nine months till the first baby. I mean, it's not, it's not that we recommend this. It's just, right. but it worked out really, really well because that was enough time, but it wasn't too much. Right. You know, it wasn't the kind of thing where, I don't know, why don't we live together for, you know, 50 mm -hmm. years before we decide whether or not to get married? That's that's not the right thing either. So, you know, prudential judgment is, 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 and it's the same thing with a startup, by the way. I don't know. I think I need a little bit more experience. So when I was writing my dissertation, I would see these guys and, you know, I was doing my PhD with like, I got to read a couple more books. Like, mm -hmm. write your dissertation, <laughs> pop the question after mm -hmm. a certain point, but not on the first date. Yeah. I didn't have any trouble with that. So yeah. for me, when I met Lisa, I did not think I was going to get married. And then How old were you? I was 24. Mm -hmm. And when we started dating, um, probably about three months in something, three, four months in something like that, I realized, oh shit, like I'm in love with her. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm either never getting married or I'm marrying this woman. Yeah. And so I proposed at eight months and we had spent some of those eight months apart. So it wasn't even like we were living together for eight months or anything because she was in England. And 
then I was ready to get married right away. I was like, what's it take to get married about three months? And she's like, you are having a laugh. She's like, no way, this is gonna take like a year to plan this wedding. So we ended up being together for about 18 months by the time we got married. Mm -hmm. But uh, good and it fast. Was, that's good. Yeah, by today's standards, perfect. that's fast. And, and by today's fast. standards, you were young. Yeah. Um, and, and again, society changes in different ways, but some of these some of these principles don't change. I don't know if any of the yeah. principles change. Yeah. That's the thing. Like circumstances do, but principles don't. Yeah. yeah. So how do you how do people grow together? Like what is the key there? Part of it is understanding that you have a you 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 are stronger when you are together <clears throat> and that one of the cues for you to change is the other person changing hmm. so not it, pe people who struggle they think the cue for me to do something different in my life is i feel differently about something one of the cues for you to do something differently in your, your life is that your spouse starts to think feel differently about that you have to take on the characteristics of the other person as if they were inside you you know, so you find, for example, that your spouse is on a spiritual journey, starts to find stirrings of spirituality. Mm. That's a cue for you to do that too. Mm. That's a cue for you to do that too. And to do that sincerely as well. And again, people say, well, you're losing your individuality and the whole thing. Yep, that's exactly right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, you're sublimating the individuality on these things to have greater strength in the union. Right, so that you can have a greater multiplicity of experiences across the two of you, greater, adventure and excitement across the two of you is the way that that works. And sometimes it's hard for people because they feel that they're the, the senior partner in the relationship. Doesn't That's not the secret to a successful marriage. Mm. Now, there are social scientists that have very heterodox views on this. There's a guy named Eli Finkel at Northwestern, um, a psychologist who's written about marriage. And he says that one of the reasons that marriage is so hard today is because we, we expect too much from it. He says, you know, we expect your best friend and your your one and only lover and your business partner and the person who helps you raise your kids and the only person to who, who knows your secrets. And it's like, it's too much pressure for one relationship that was distributed across 10 people until about the 19th century or the 20th century. And but in the time of the romantic era uh, uh, where in, in when when romance took on its modern connotations, which is it's everything, mm -hmm. it's magic. It's a, you know, it's a, it, it simulates the relationship with God, even so the language that we've used in this conversation, that then it took on too much pressure. And he recommends in his book about this, that, and in his work and his, his very interesting research, that you, you, you ease off on the throttle a little bit, that you don't expect your wife to be your best friend necessarily. He even suggests that some couples do better when they're not the only exclusive sexual partner. I disagree with that. I, say, well. I disagree with that. I don't, think that the, I don't think the data support that. I mean, again, as they say in finance, your results may differ, right. but they certainly don't in my case or yours. Yeah, that, uh, that one I can't imagine. Having unshared sexual experience. The only thing that I can imagine is if, yay, if you're like sharing something, by all means. But when people go off, I just don't see how that works. And I certainly don't see how it works if you invite another person into the stable pair bond. Like, whoa. Yeah, I know, and there's actually, you, you as an evolution guy, you'll you really, really like this literature that talks about why it screws up relationships. Mm. So there's a guy at University of Texas that does work on jealousy on the evolutionary basis of jealousy. And he had this hypothesis that men are more jealous of sexual infidelity For and sure. women are more jealous of emotional infidelity. Yep. And so what he does is he finds that, that, that women in relationships they will forgive their husbands for sexual discretions, but not for falling in love with yeah, another woman. And a man, if, it, if, if your wife says, I, I mean, yeah, I had an affair, all that, but it was only because I felt like I was falling in love. The sex was terrible. You'll be right. like, I, for, I forgive you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgive you. It's so asymmetrically weird. And the reason for this from an evolutionary basis is that males have to be really vigilant about making sure they're not inadvertently raising the offspring mm. of another male. Yeah. And women have to be very vigilant to make sure that the provider and defender of the family doesn't stray and take a, and defend and provide for another family yep. and, another, and another female's offspring. And so that's why the the jealousy is going to work in that particular mm -hmm. way but no matter what i'm telling you if you have if you have an open marriage somebody's gonna fall in love 
you know, yeah. and and there's all kinds of stuff that can that can go wrong on that. So that's not. I mean, again, it's like uh, different social scientists disagree on that. But I think my reading of the data and my prudential judgment, not just my Catholicism, suggests that that's not a wise course of action mm. for most. I'm a big believer. I, I think you're right about that. I'm a big believer in what I call frame of reference. Yeah. So your frame of reference are your set of beliefs and your values. Right. There's other things at the fringes, but that's the core of it. And it will make all the difference. It's not what happens. It's how you perceive what happens. Just going back to Victor, Victor Frankl. So to that point, you said guys have to be really hyper protective that they're not raising somebody else's kid, but you adopted a kid. Right. And so that to me speaks to frame of reference. So, yeah. and I've heard you say that you have every bit of love for yeah. your adopted daughter that you have for your biological kids, yeah. which I have no reason to believe is not yeah. true. So what did you do to your frame of reference in order to be able to welcome her? And even though we would both agree that from an evolutionary standpoint, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, it well, yeah, from an evolutionary standpoint, it actually might make sense from an evolutionary standpoint, because if you, if there's an orphan, even in nature, mm. will be adopted interesting. By, by non-human mammals will adopt orphans as their own. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it will be even a mistake. So you see a, the, the cuckoo bird will actually lay its eggs in the nest of other birds and then the egg, knock the eggs out of the nest of the, other, of the, of the birds mm -hmm. that, that have the nest. And then the cuckoo will hatch and be taken care of by the surrogate mother, the it's unknowing where the name surrogate, cuckold surrogate. comes from. Right? Yeah, exactly right. And then, of course, the cuckoo is twice the size the regular bird, so it's hilarious because you know the the the, the parents baby are raising bird a is, gigantor. Is, exactly, I know, it's, yeah. it's the funniest thing. So, so there there is some evolutionary basis for that in the case of not raising somebody else's offspring per se, but raising an orphan and bringing the mm. child into your own family. And one of the things that you find is that it, the my experience, but also the research shows that the oxytocin release for an adopted child is just as high as it is for a biological child. Hmm. So you basically know that this is my child. You lay eyes on that child and it's 4th of July all over. It's Roman candles in your head. And, and it is forever. And so it's funny because you don't actually know till you do it. It's all a theory. Right. Oh yeah, no, you know, the bond with the adopted child will be just as much as with the biological child. It's, it's, it's weird because intellectually it's a, it's a stronger bond in some ways because it's this, this election, it's this human will on top of the neurophysiology of, mm. of human connection on top of it. It's really something, I have to say, it's funny. It's funny, but it's just deep, 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 deep love. Mm. And for both 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 kinds of kids, it's really interesting. Yeah. Speaking of kids, how does a good Catholic end up with a son who becomes a sniper? <laughs> yeah, there have been a lot of good uh, good service members in the Marine Corps, but my son Carlos, it's interesting. So I used to, <clears throat> I my my approach with my kids has been given that life is a startup, they need a business plan, and I need a business plan from them because I'm VC. Right. And I deserve a good business plan. And so I had my kids write business plans in high school. And when they were not original or no good, I'd send it back for revisions. And Carlos's business plan had like six rounds of revisions. The first one was very unoriginal. He was not a motivated student in high school. <clears throat> it was always like, you know, it's, he's getting a C in history. He's getting a D in Latin. He's getting, you know, all this. And, and he, he's clear he was not cut out for the you know, the, for college. Mm -hmm. And when it came time, you know, he got a big athletic scholarship. He's a great, big, healthy, strapping, coordinated athletic boy. And, um, but I said, in his business plan, you need something more original than that. You know, I'm an academic, so this is breaking my heart, but you know, so finally he comes back and he says, part of it is because your business plan as a kid has to answer two questions, by the way, as an adult too. The question, the, the, the meaning requires that you have two answers to two questions. This is the diagnostic test. Why are you alive? And for what are you willing to die today? Mm. If you don't have answers to those questions, you have a meaning crisis. I don't know what your answers are, but you have to have real answers, not BS answers, not How nonsense answers. How old were they when you started asking this High question? school. So like junior year in high school. Mm. And he didn't have answers. So where are you going to go find the answers? And he had a very good answer to the question of how to find the answers, <laughs> which was, I want to go work hard with my hands outdoors. Why do you think that was a good answer? Because I, I believe that that was the case for him. He's a very kinetic boy. Mm. You know, he was, a, he was a kid who, he had um, strong 
um, an affinity for the outdoors, fishing, hunting, which is not in our family. You know, I didn't grow up. I, I, I used to I used to go fishing every year in Lincoln City and the on the Oregon coast when I was a kid and you know, that kind of thing, but outdoorsman, my dad was a professor, right? And, and so, but he was really into it. He's good at what, good at that whole thing. So he took a job as a, a dry land wheat farmer up in Idaho in Grangeville and worked two harvests, made a bunch of money. He was alone all the time with his thoughts. He was mm. digging rocks out of the soil and mending fences and driving. Was out. he making it spiritual for himself or did well, just he the was, nature he was going to church. Way. I mean, he was, I was kind of half-heartedly, you know, but, but it wasn't spiritual so much as he was, he was looking for these answers to meaning. You know, why am I alive? What does it mean for me to be alive? For, mm. for what would I be willing to die? And at the end of that, and, and this was kind of vaguely part of the business plan, but it became clearer as time went on. He said, I want to, I want to join the Marines. I want to see what I'm made of. And, and so he did, and it was hard. You know, boot camp was hard. He broke his foot a couple of times. and A couple of times? Twice. Jesus. Yeah, and then he went into the infantry training battalion because he was a war fighter, which is 15% of the Marine Corps are... are our combat marines. What does that mean? I thought they were all war fighters. Yeah, but eighty-five percent are in support roles. Fifteen percent of the war fighters, the door Whoa. kickers, and the and the riflemen. Wow, I didn't realize it was yeah. that lopsided. Yes, he was in the infantry. Yeah, Whoa. for sure. I mean, there's logistics and mechanics, and I mean, there's mm. so many jobs to support the fifteen percent. And then from there, he became a mortarman, and from there, he went into the elite sniper corps, which is a really, really you hard. Freaked in out dock. during any of this? Kind of, except that. What do you want as a dad? You want a kid who has the answers to these questions because this is what it means to be fully alive. Hmm. There's this saint in the fourth century named Saint Irenaeus, and he's most famous for saying the glory of God is a man fully alive. Like, don't give me half dead. Don't give me half dead. And half dead is I don't know why I'm alive, and I don't know what for what I'm willing to die. I want. I want my kids, I want the people in my life and my friends to be able to have answers to these particular questions. So I was scared, but I was, I was energized by his particular energy. Hmm. And it's so interesting because, you know, the, the, the sniper corps, the scout sniper platoon, which is a, which is a, a, a branch of the special forces, they, <laughs> they sit three hours behind the scope of a rifle just sitting there and they're, they're, this is a kid who couldn't concentrate in school. Hmm. I mean, he could, he was like ADHD whatever that is you know it's a it's it's a, it's a funny diagnosis he, their their motto is suffer patiently patiently suffer <laughs> that's my son i'm super proud of him i'm scared but i'm super proud of him is he active duty yeah he's Oof. active duty he's down to Oof. camp pendleton Oof. right now yeah for sure for sure he's how does how he's does 23 he... years old he's married wow he's uh he because when he when he got that, you know, when he got that, then things became clearer when he answered, because, you know, why are and you alive? Did you already say what he said? Because if you did, sorry, I missed no, it. No, I didn't. His answers are, I am alive because God made me. For what am I willing to die today? For my faith, for my family, for my friends, and for the United States of America. Whoa. And for our allies, <laughs> for those of you listening, or, you know, that he died for you too. And, and those aren't everybody's answers. Those might not be your answers, but man, those are solid answers. And when you have the answers, life proceeds. Life proceeds, life becomes linear, life becomes clear. That's why meaning is so critically important. And boy, that, my son taught me a lot. My, it's like, I got the theories, I got the data, but seeing it play out, it's, it's thrilling. So, you know, the phone rings at 2 a.m., don't like it. Not looking forward to that. Mm. When he's like, yeah, going on a field trip. Not great. Not great. But I'll take it. I'll take it all day. Every time I get to spend time with you, I love it the most. It's amazing. Where can people follow you? Where can they get the new book? Thank you. Arthurbrooks.com is that has this sort of it, 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 it collects all the stuff that I do. Mm. My column on the science of happiness is published called how to, is build is how to build a life at the Atlantic every Thursday morning in the Atlantic, the Atlantic, um, dot com. And my new book with Oprah Winfrey, build the life you want, the art and science of getting happier September 12th from penguin random house. I wrote it because I want people to understand these ideas to change <clears throat> to change their habits and, and share these ideas with others mm. thank you for having this conversation with me thank course, you for what man. you're doing thank you for your heart ah thank you the book's amazing everybody i highly encourage you to pick it up 
And speaking of things I highly encourage you to do, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. To learn more about artificial intelligence, check out this episode with Mo Gadot. We've never created a nuclear weapon that can create nuclear weapons. The artificial intelligences that we're building are capable of creating other artificial intelligences. As a matter of fact, they're in